Section 1 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, USA. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Geology. Chapter 1 The Ancient Cosmogonies Part 1 This earth whereon man lives, by which he has his being and to which he returns, was to the ancients a riddle inexplicable. What mighty hand, they wondered, could have upreared the mountain peaks whose glittering summits pierced the very clouds? What fearsome figure lurked in the volcanic forge where subterranean rumblings seemed to tell of life within? What stupendous power could evoke from nowhere the shrieking tempest which destructively could mock the puny efforts of the world of men? Answer there must be, and the beginnings of geology are the cosmogonies devised by inexact observation and by fancy to propound a suitable reply. The earliest efforts at the interpretation of nature found their expression in the mythologies and cosmogonies of primitive peoples, which varied in type from country to country, according to the climate and other physical conditions under which they had their birth. Geological speculation may thus be said to be traceable in the mental conceptions of the remotest pre-scientific ages. Among these first gropings after truth, the Babylonian account of the creation holds an honored place, not only by reason of its completeness, but also because modern knowledge of it is gained from tablets of extreme antiquity, tablets which in themselves hold high rank in the records of historical importance. With the Babylonians, creation begins with chaos. The gods arose before heaven and earth had taken shape, while the tumultuous floods of oceans were still intermingled in the universal chaos. The gods chose Marduk to be their champion against Tiamat, the disturbing, chaotic ocean flood. Marduk armed himself with lightning flash and thunderbolt and called the winds to his assistance. Marduk vanquished Tiamat and divided his corpse into two parts— from the one part he created the heavens, and from the other the earth and the sea. Marduk peopled the heavens with stars, the dwellings of the great gods. Then followed the creation of plants and animals, and finally the creation of the two first human beings out of clay. The Mosaic account of the creation far excels the Babylonian in its noble simplicity, and in the strength and beauty of the language. In it the origin of the world, of the earth and its inhabitants, is represented as the work of a personal God. The Mosaic account, which is especially distinguishable among early cosmogonies by its recognition of the existence of light before the actual orb of the sun was visible, due to dense aqueous atmosphere, was incorporated in the Bible of the Christian Church, and, unfortunately, became invested with a scientific value which was mistakenly embroiled with the idea of verbal inspiration and infallibility. This retarded the development of geology for many centuries, inasmuch as theologians regarded the Mosaic account as a divine revelation and sought to suppress any investigations and writings of scientific interest which did not harmonize with their interpretation of it. The Greeks were less inclined than the Oriental nations to interweave the ideas of mythology, religion, and science. They viewed natural events from a more critical standpoint and treated them as subjects of philosophical speculation. In their early Ionian days, however, their understanding of the cosmogony was comparatively primitive. Though heightened and made of interest by the imaginative force with which they peopled that portion of the earth's surface which was remote to them. Homer's contributions to ancient geography were large and curious, but cosmogonical ideas do not seem to have occurred to him. 
he presupposed that the earth was flat, and that the sun truly sank into the sea. Hesiod, in his Theogony, tells of the birth of the world and time, Cronus. He describes the wars of the older and the Olympian gods. But he seems to have accepted the prevalent conception of the world as a flat disk with Greece at the center. These early cosmogonies, while differing greatly in style, elaboration of detail, and the degree to which they expressed the conceit of the author, had certain points in common. They all agree on successive alternate creations and destructions of the world. These speculations were closely interwoven with their religion, as were all the sciences, and the destructions were supposed to come when man's sin had become intolerable to the then ruling deity. The following creation included a race of men free from sin and taint of all kinds, who immediately proceeded to gradually degenerate. In the Institutes of Menu, the sacred volume of the Hindus, is the following verse. There are creations also and destruction of worlds innumerable. The being supremely exalted performs all this with as much ease as if in sport, again and again, for the sake of conferring happiness. There are at the same time such puerile conceits and monstrous absurdities in this cosmogony, says Sir Charles Lyell in his famous Principles of Geology, that some may be disposed to impute to mere accident any slight approximation to truth or apparent coincidence between the Oriental dogmas and observed facts. This pretended revelation, however, was not purely an effort of the unassisted imagination, nor invented without regard to the opinions and observations of naturalists. There are introduced into it certain astronomical theories, evidently derived from observation and reasoning. Thus, for instance, it is declared that, at the North Pole, the year was divided into a long day and night, and that their long day was the northern, and their night the southern course of the sun. And to the inhabitants of the moon, it is said, one day is equal in length to one month of mortals. The Brahmins and Chinese corroborated this notion of successive creations and destructions, and also described a great flood. Plutarch tells us that this was the subject of one of the famous hymns of Orpheus. In his verses he sets a definite period for each cycle or life of a world. Orpheus assigned 120,000 years, while Cassandra took it to be 360,000 years. The Egyptian priests were aware not only that the soil beneath the plains of the Nile, but also that the hills bounding the great valley contained marine shells, and it could hardly have escaped the observation of Eastern philosophers that some soils were filled with fossil remains, since so many national works requiring extensive excavations were executed by Oriental monarchs in very remote eras. Thales of Miletus the contemporary of Croesus and Cyrus, who considered that everything animate and inanimate was derived from water, added but little to early cosmology, save that his theory presupposed a condition of constant flux. His gifted scholar, Anaximander, circa 611 B.C., arrived at a higher conception of nature. He depicted an infinite, all-pervading primeval substance, possessing an inherent power of movement from the first. The energy of this primeval matter determined heat and cold, and the mixture of these conditions gave origin to the development of fluid. The earth, the air, and a surrounding circle of fire differentiated from the fluid state. The stars sprang from fire and air. The earth rested in the center of the whole universe, and, under the influence of the sun, brought forth the animals which inhabit it. These, including human beings, were at first fish-like in form, consistent with the semi-fluid state of their environment. Xenophanes of Colophon, 614 B.C., is reported by later writers to have observed the shell remains of pelagic mollusca on mountains in the middle of the land, impressions of laurel leaves in the rocks of Paros, as well as various evidences of the former presence of the sea on the ground of Malta. 
and to have attributed those appearances to periodic invasions of the sea, during which men and their dwellings must have been submerged. The historian Xanthus of Sardis, circa 500 B.C., also drew attention to the occurrence of fossil shells in Armenia, Phrygia, and Lydia, far from the sea, and concluded that the localities where such remains occur had been formerly the bed of the ocean, and that the limits of the dry land in the ocean were constantly undergoing change. Herodotus, 484 B.C., mentioned the presence of fossil shells of marine bivalves in the mountains of Egypt and near the oasis of Ammon. From this fact, as well as from the salt constitution of the rocks, Herodotus formed the opinion that Lower Egypt had been at one time covered by the sea, and that the material carried down by the Nile had been discharged into the sea basin between Thebes and Memphis and the current delta, and gradually filled it up. Herodotus could not form any definite opinion as to the cause of the Nile inundations, although he gave a careful report of the hypothesis then in favor. The gorge of Tempe, previously referred to, also came under the notice of the father of history. He says that the gorge of Tempe was caused by Poseidon is probable. At least one who attributes earthquakes and chasms to that god would say that this gorge was his work. It seemed to me to be quite evident that the mountains had there been torn asunder by an earthquake. Heraclitus, 535 B.C., thought there was in the universe nothing stable, nothing lasting. Everything was in a state of constant change, like a stream in which new waves endlessly supplant the old. For him fire was the primeval force, which unceasingly transformed itself, pervaded every portion of the universe, produced individuals, and again destroyed them. Fire became the ocean, and that again earth, and the breath of life. The rising vapors burned in the air and formed the sun, which was renewed from day to day. Thus Heraclitus taught that although the universe always had been, and always would be, no portion of it had ever been quiescent, and that from time to time a new world was constructed out of the old. Pythagoras, who was born at Samos about the year 582 B.C. and afterward went to Crotona in Italy, is one of those eminent leaders of thought around whose name and teaching much that is mythical has gathered. His followers, suggests Karl von Zittel in his History of Geology and Paleontology, sought to explain natural phenomena chiefly by analogy with definite numerical relationships. An ordered universe depended, according to the Pythagoreans, upon the principle of numbers. According to Diogenes Laertius, Pythagoras imagined the universe in the form of a sphere. The earth was in the center, and bore the axis around which the firmament revolved. The principle of constant change taught by Pythagoras and Heraclitus was also a leading feature in the doctrines of Empedocles of Agrigentum, 492-432 to 432 B.C. Empedocles supposed that everything had its origin in, and took its components from, four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. That these elements were without beginning and imperishable, but subject to never-ending change. From these elements the world at one time took shape, and it must at some future time be again dispersed. The course of the world's existence resolved itself into a history of recurring periods and phases. Geology owes one distinct step in advance to this philosopher. Whereas the Pythagoreans had conjectured the presence of a central fire in the universe, Empedocles taught that the earth's center was composed of molten material. Empedocles formed this opinion on the basis of his actual observation of the volcanic activities of Mount Etna. Tradition says that he met his death by falling into the crater of that volcano. Plato, 427 B.C., in his cosmology, is a follower partly of Heraclitus and partly of Anaxagoras. According to Plato, the universe is the production of divine intelligence and of the necessary development of nature. The form of the whole universe is spherical. 
In the center lies the earth as a motionless sphere. An interesting account is given in the Timaeus of a submerged Atlantic continent, Atlantis, on the other side of the pillars of Hercules, Gibraltar. The idea of such a submerged continent has again and again received credence. In Plato's account, Atlantis was larger than Asia and Libya together. It had been inhabited 9,000 years before his time, and since its destruction by earthquakes and inundations, navigation in the Atlantic had been impossible owing to the fine mud and detritus left by the vanished land. Another of Plato's theories related to the origin of rivers. He attributed them to a common underground source. End of section 1 Recording by Eric Metzler Albuquerque, USA August 2015Section 2 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Metzler, Albuquerque, USA. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Geology. Chapter 1. The Ancient Cosmogonies, Part 2 The work of Aristotle, 384-322 to B.C., marks the culminating point reached by the Greeks, both in the domain of speculative philosophy and in that of empirical observation. His treatises furnish an admirable exposition of the state of natural knowledge in his time. When he wrote... The geocentric view of the universe was still publicly accepted without question. But he had firmly grasped certain truths regarding the globe, which, though taught long ago by some of his predecessors, were not yet generally admitted. Accepting the common belief that the world consisted of four elements, he looked on these as arranged according to their relative densities. He said, The water is spread as an envelope round the earth. In the same way above the water lies the sphere of air, while outside of all comes the sphere of fire. With regard to the surface of the planet, Aristotle had formed some sagacious conclusions, though mingled with certain of the misconceptions that were prevalent in his time. He remarks that earthquakes are due to a commingling of moist and dry within the earth. Of itself the earth is dry, but from rain it acquires much internal humidity. Hence, when it is warmed by the sun and by the internal heat, wind is produced both within and without its mass. Wind, being the lightest and the most rapidly moving body, is the cause of motion in other bodies. And fire, united with wind, becomes flame which is endowed with great rapidity of motion. It is neither water nor earth which causes an earthquake. It is the wind when what is vaporized outside returns into the interior. Aristotle regarded earthquakes and volcanic eruptions as closely related phenomena. He states that it had been observed in some places that an earthquake has continued until the wind from the interior has rushed out with violence to the surface, as had then recently happened at Heraclea on the Euxine, and before that event at Hiera, volcano, one of the Lipari Isles. At this latter locality the ground rose up with a great noise, and formed a hill that broke up, and allowed much wind to escape from the fissures, together with sparks and cinders which buried the whole of the neighboring town of the Liparans. The shock was even felt in some of the towns on the opposite mainland of Italy. Aristotle was further led to propose an explanation of the great heat that forms part of the volcanic phenomena. The fire within the earth can only be due to the air becoming inflamed by the shock, when it is violently separated into the minutest fragments. What takes place in the Lipari Isles affords an additional proof that the winds circulate underneath the earth. This idea that volcanic action was mainly due to the movement of wind imprisoned within the earth obtained wide credence in antiquity. 
Aeolius, the god of the winds, was believed to have his abode under the so-called Aeolian Isles, which are all of volcanic origin, and among which eruptions have been taking place since before the dawn of history. This tireless observer of antiquity also discusses the phenomena presented by rivers, and shows considerable acquaintance with the drainage system on the north side of the Mediterranean basin. He criticizes previously expressed opinions as to the source of rivers, particularly ridiculing the su suggestion of Plato that all rivers flow directly from a vast mass of water under the earth. He appears to have held the opinion that just as the vaporized moisture in the atmosphere is condensed by cold and falls in drops of rain, so the moisture beneath the earth is similarly condensed and forms the sources of rivers. He states that the mountains, by their cold temperature, condense the atmospheric moisture and receive a vast quantity of water, so that they may be compared to an enormous suspended sponge. He shows by geographical illustrations, drawn from Asia and the Mediterranean basin, that the largest rivers descend from the loftiest ground, where the water accumulates in numberless channels. He admits the possible existence of underground lakes from which rivers may issue, and alludes to the disappearance of some streams into subterranean channels. No writer of antiquity has expressed himself more philosophically than Aristotle regarding the past vicissitudes of the earth's surface. Having studied so carefully the operations of the various agents that are now modifying that surface, he recognized how greatly the aspect of the land must have been transformed in the course of ages. His remarks on this subject have a strikingly modern tone. He contemplates the alternations of land and sea and furnishes illustrations of them, much as a geologist of today might do. The sea now covers tracts that were formerly dry land, and land will one day reappear where we now find sea. These phenomena escape our notice because they take place successively during periods of time which, in comparison of our brief existence, are immensely protracted. Whole nations may disappear without any recollection being preserved of the great terrestrial changes which they have witnessed from beginning to end. The deluge of Deucalion, Aristotle suggests, affected Greece only, and principally the part called Hellas, and it arose from great inundations of rivers during a rainy winter. But such extraordinary winters, though after a certain period they return, do not always revisit the same places. He concludes with these remarkable words. It is clear that, as time never stops and the universe is eternal, the Tanais and the Nile, like all other rivers, have not always flowed. The ground which they now water was once dry. But if rivers are born and perish, and if the same parts of the land are not always covered with water, the sea must undergo similar changes abandoning some places and returning to others, so that the same regions do not remain always sea or always land, but all change their condition in the course of time. The great advances along certain lines of thought under the impetus of the Roman leadership infused a more realistic spirit into the investigations of all great workers in natural science, especially those interested in geology. Among the latter, the first place must be given to the historian and traveler Strabo, circa 63 B.C., whose geography, comprising seventeen volumes, was written about the beginning of the reign of Tiberius. It contains not a few important facts in regard to the general effects of subterranean energy. Thus he cites a number of earthquakes by which chasms in the ground were formed. Thousands of people were destroyed and cities were swallowed up. He also gives some information regarding volcanic eruptions which had taken place within the historical period in the Mediterranean region. In his time Mount Vesuvius was not only quiescent, but was not known ever to have been active. His quick eye, however, detected the true origin of the mountain. From the aspect of its summit he inferred that it was once a volcano, with live craters which had become extinct on the failure of the subterranean fuel and he compared its slopes to the ground around Catania, where the ashes thrown out by Etna have formed an excellent soil for vines. He recognized the truly volcanic nature of the whole district from Etna to the Phlegrean fields, 
under which Typhon, as Pindar sang, lay crushed on his burning bed. In his excellent account of the ascent of Etna, Strabo compares the molten lava to a kind of black mud which, liquefied in the craters, is ejected from them and flows down the sides of the mountain, cooling and congealing in its descent, until it becomes a motionless dark rock-like millstone. He also attributes earthquakes to the force of winds pent up within the earth. The doctrine that volcanoes are safety valves, therefore, which has been quoted as a modern idea, is prior in origin to the beginning of the present error. The oceanic islands far from any mainland have, according to Strabo, been thrown up by subterranean fires. In support of this view, Strabo cited the case of a volcanic eruption in the year 196 B.C. between Thera and Therasia. For four days flames rose from the ocean, and as these died down, it was observed that a new island had been formed, measuring twelve stadia in circumference. Strabo is therefore rightly regarded as the father of modern theories of mountain-making. He pointed out that Sicily in his time was less frequently disturbed by earthquakes than it had been in previous ages, before volcanic discharges were known in the district, and he correlated the comparative tranquility of the ground with the means of escape afforded for explosive underground vapors by the volcanic vents that had opened at Etna, in the Lipari Isles, and in Ischia. It speaks highly for Strabo's powers of observation that he should have recognized in Vesuvius a volcanic mountain, although it was then quiescent. Probably the most acute scientific observer of Roman times was Seneca, the physician of the Emperor Nero, 2 B.C. to 65 A.D. Quite recently, Nering has placed the importance of the work of Seneca in its true light. The Questiones Naturales contain detailed communications about earthquakes, volcanoes, and the constructive and destructive agencies of water. Seneca explains earthquakes partly as a result of the expansion of gases accumulated in the earth, partly by the collapse of subterranean cavities. He appears to have been much impressed by the earthquake which did so much damage in Campania on February 5th, 63 A.D., for he refers to it again and again, and furnishes from the lips of eyewitnesses some interesting particulars regarding it. Thus he tells how a flock of six hundred sheep were killed in the district of Pompeii, a fate which he attributes to the rise of pestilential vapors from the ground. He was informed by a most learned and serious friend that when he was in the bath, the tiles on the floor were separated from each other, and were then driven together again, while the water at one moment sank through the open joints of the pavement, and thereafter boiled up again and was jerked out. The philosopher's account of, is the de earliest detailed description of an earthquake which has come down to us. Seneca regarded volcanic eruptions simply as an intensified form of the same series of phenomena, and volcanoes themselves as canals or vents between local subterrestrial reservoirs of molten material and the earth's surface. In speaking of two outbreaks at Centaurin, he remarks that an island rose out of the sea by protracted eruptions from below, and he notes that the internal fire is neither extinguished by the weight of the superincumbent depth of sea nor prevented from rushing to a height of a couple of hundred paces above the water. He speaks of Etna having sometimes abounded in much fire and thrown out a great deal of burning sand, day being turned into night, to the terror of the population. On such occasions thunder and lightning are said to have abounded, but these came from the concourse of dry materials and not from ordinary clouds, of which probably there were none in such a raging heat of air a shrewd anticipation of the modern distinction between ordinary atmospheric electric discharges and those evoked during the ejection of vapors, gases, dust, and stones from a volcanic orifice. The earth to him, however, was primitively a watery chaos, and it is more especially in his treatment of the action of water in dissolving and carrying away rock material, together with this explanation of the origin of sediments and deltas, that Seneca has shown his remarkable insight and sound judgment. His ideas on the origin of river water were no further advanced than those of his predecessors. 
he agreed with them in attributing all rivers to an inexhaustible internal source. Water being one of the four elements forms a fourth part of nature. Why then, he argued, should there be surprise if it can always keep pouring out? Just as in the human body there are veins which when ruptured send forth blood, so, he thought, in the earth there are veins of water which are found even in the driest places, at depths of two or three hundred feet, and which when laid open issue in springs and rivers. The water at these depths, so far below the limits to which rain can moisten the earth, is not regarded by him of atmospheric origin, but living water, aqua viva. The learned historian Pliny the Elder, 23-79 to 79 A.D., has handed down to us a compendium that embraces the whole scientific knowledge of antiquity. By a tragic decree of fate, this untiring student and naturalist met his death while engaged in observing the grandest geological event of historical antiquity, the first outbreak of Vesuvius in the year 79 A.D. He died in the open field, probably suffocated by the volcanic vapor and ash. His corpse was found unharmed three days later, when the darkened sky finally became clear. The younger Pliny's vivid description of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius and the accompanying earthquake is one of the most remarkable literary productions in the domain of geology. End of section 2 Recording by Eric Metzler Albuquerque, USA November 2015《Section 3 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Geology. Chapter 2. The Beginnings of Cartography, Part 1. In the ancient records, there is considerable doubt as to who were the earliest voyagers. Some authorities uphold the claims of the Greeks, some the Phoenicians, others the Egyptians, and still others the Chinese. Advocates of the Chinese claim base their conclusion on the location of the Ark of Noah. It is alleged that the Ark rested on one of the mountains of Armenia, and that Scythia was the first land to be inhabited, it being of high altitude and therefore the first to appear after the flood. But such an argument, based upon a local tradition, not upon scientific evidence, has little force. Mankind, at least that portion whose history is familiar, dwelt upon the borders of an inland Mediterranean sea. They had never heard of such an expanse of water as the Atlantic, and certainly had never seen it. The landlocked sheet which lay spread out at their feet was at all times full of mystery and often even of dread and secret misgiving. Those who ventured forth upon its bosom came home and told marvelous tales of the sights they had seen and the perils they had endured. Homer's heroes returned to Ithaca with the music of the sirens in their ears and the cruelties of the giants upon their lips. The Argonauts saw whirling rocks implanted in the sea to warn and repel the approaching navigator, and as if the mystery of the waters had tinged with fable even the dry land beyond it, they filled the Caucasus with wild stories of enchantresses, of bulls that breathed fire, and of a race of men that sprang like a ripened harvest from the prolific soil. If the ancients were ignorant of the shape of the earth, it was for the very reason they were ignorant of the ocean. The geographers and philosophers, whose observations were confined to fragments of Europe, Asia, and Africa, alternately made the world a cylinder, a flat surface begirt by water, a drum, a boat, a disc. The legends that sprang from these confused and contradictory notions made the land a scene of marvels and the water an abode of terrors. It is now generally conceded that the date of the maritime enterprises which rendered the Phoenicians famous in antiquity must be fixed between the years 1700 and 1100 B.C. The renowned city of Sidon was the center from which their expeditions were sent forth. About 1250 B.C., their ships ventured cautiously beyond the Straits of Gibraltar and founded Cadiz upon a coast washed by the Atlantic. A little later, they founded establishments upon the western coast of Africa. Homer asserts that at the Trojan War, 1194 B.C., the Phoenicians furnished the belligerents with many articles of luxury and convenience, and their ships brought gold to Solomon from Ophir in 1000 B.C. About the period of Tyre's greatness, 600 B.C., the Phoenicians, though under Egyptian commanders, 
appear to have succeeded in the circumnavigation of Africa. The enterprise was undertaken by order of Nico, king of Egypt, and is commented on by Herodotus as follows. Having in this manner consumed two years, in the third they passed the pillars of Hercules and returned to Egypt. This story may be believed by others, but to me it appears incredible, for they affirm that when they sailed round Libya, they had the sun on the right hand. In the time of Herodotus, the Greeks were unacquainted with the phenomenon of a shadow falling to the south, one which the Phoenicians would naturally have witnessed had they actually passed the Cape of Good Hope, for the sun would have been on their right hand, or in the north, and would thus have rejected shadows to the south. As this story was not one likely to have been invented in the time of Nico, suggests F.B. Goodrich in his Man Upon the Sea, from which some of these adventures are condensed, it is the strongest proof that could be adduced of the reality of the voyage. The first maritime adventure among the Greeks which lays any claim to authenticity, and the most celebrated in ancient times, is the expedition of the Argonauts to Colchis. The date of the expedition, if it took place at all, may be safely fixed at the year 1250 BC. A theory propounded by Sir Isaac Newton would connect it with the year 937, but this is regarded with less favor than the earlier date. Its alleged object was the Golden Fleece, but what this was can only be conjectured. Jason, the son of the king of Thessaly, being deprived of his inheritance and having resolved to seek his fortune by some remote and hazardous expedition, was induced to go in quest of the Golden Fleece in Colchis. He enlisted fifty men and employed Argus to build him a ship, which from him was called Argo, the adventurers being named Argonauts. The Argonauts started their voyage from Iolcos in Thessaly, and with a south wind sailed east by north. The narrative of the expedition is full of wonders. They landed at the island of Lemnos, where they found that the women had just murdered their husbands and fathers. The Argonauts supplied the place of the assassinated relatives, and Jason had two sons by one of the bereaved Lemnians. When the vessel arrived at the entrance to the Euxane, the narrow strait now called the Bosphorus, they built a temple and implored the protection of gods against the Symbolgades, or whirling rocks, which guarded the passage. A seer named Phineas was consuited upon the probability of their sailing through unharmed. The rocks were imagined to float upon the waves, and when anything attempted to pass through, to seize and crush it. Phineas advised the loosing of a dove to judge from its fate of the destiny reserved for them. They did so, determined to push boldly on if the bird got through in safety. The pigeon escaped with the loss of some of its tail feathers. The Argo dashed onward and cleared the formidable rocks with the loss of a few of its stern ornaments. From this time forward, the legend adds, the simple gades remained fixed and were no longer a terror to navigators. The Argonauts, after entering the Black Sea, sailed due east to the mouth of the river Phasis, now the Rione. Aedes, the king, promised to give Jason the fleece upon certain conditions. These he was enabled to fulfill by the aid of Medea, a sorceress and daughter of Aedes. They then fled together to Greece. This route, followed by the Argonauts upon their return, is differently given by the various poets who have told the story and the commentators who have illustrated it. The Greeks, like the Hebrews, were ignorant of the real figure of the earth. It is in Homer that is found the first written trace of the widely prevalent idea that the earth is a flat surface begirt on every side by the ocean. This was a natural belief in a region almost insular like Greece where the visible horizon and an enveloping sea suggested the idea of a flat circle. Homer took the lead among the poetic geographers of Greece, and his authority gave to the subject a fanciful cast, the traces of which are not yet obliterated. Beneath the earth he placed the fabled regions of Elysium and Tartarus. Above the whole rose the grand arch of the heavens, which were supposed to rest on the summits of the highest mountains. The sun, moon, and stars were believed to rise from the waves of the sea and to sink again beneath them on the return from the skies. Homer's distribution of the land was even more fantastic. Beyond the limits of Greece and the western coasts of Asia Minor, his knowledge was uncertain and obscure. He had heard vaguely of Thebes, the mighty capital of Egypt, and in his verse sang of its hundred gates and of the countless hosts it sent forth to battle. The Ethiopians, who lived beyond, were deemed to be the most remote dwellers upon the habitable earth. Toward the center of Africa were the stupendous ridges of the Atlas Mountains. Homer defined the highest peak and made it a giant, supporting upon his shoulders the outspreading canopy of the heavens. The narrow passage leading from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, and now known as the Straits of Gibraltar, was believed to have been discovered by Hercules, and the mountains on either side, Gibraltar and Queda, were, from him, called the Pillars of Hercules. 
Colchos, upon the Black Sea, was believed to be an ocean city, and here Greek fancy located the palace of the sea. It was here that the charioteer of the skies gave rest to his coursers during the night, and from whence in the morning he drove them forth again. Colchos, therefore, was Homer's eastern confine of the globe. On the north, Rhodope, or the Rypean Mountains, were supposed to enclose the Hyperborean limits of the world. Beyond them dwelt a fabled race, seated in the recesses of their valleys and sheltered from the contests of the elements. They were represented as exempt from all ills, physical and moral, from sickness, the changes of the seasons, and even from death. A race directly the converse of the ideal Hyperboreans were the Chimerians, located at the south of the Sea of Azov, who are described by Homer as dwelling in perpetual darkness and never visited by the sun. He imagines the existence of numerous other nations who long continued to hold a place in ancient geography. The Cyclops, who had but one eye, were placed in Sicily. The Aramaspians, similarly affected, inhabited the frontiers of India. The Pygmies, or Dwarves, who fought pitched battles with the Cranes, were supposed to dwell in Africa, in India, and in fact, to occupy the whole southern border of the earth. In the time of Homer, says F.B. Goodrich again, all voyages in which the mariner lost sight of land were considered as fraught with the extremest peril. No navigator ever visited Africa or Sicily from choice, but only when driven there by tempest and typhoon, and then his woes usually terminated in shipwreck. A return was not merely a marvel, but a miracle. Homer made Sicily the principal scene of the lamentable adventures of Ulysses, and sufficient traces are furnished by the Odyssey of the distorted and exaggerated notions entertained in the poet's time of the character of places reached by a voyage at sea. The existence of monsters of frightful form and size, such as Polyphemus, of treacherous enchantresses such as Circe, of amiable goddesses like Calypso, were prefigured by the early geographers and the location of their homes marked on the early charts. The radius of the territories described by Homer with any degree of precision was hardly three miles in length. Hesiod, who lived a century after Homer, thus states the scientific attainments of his time. The space between the heavens and the earth is exactly the same as that between the earth and Tartarus beneath it. A brazen anvil, if tossed from heaven, would fall during nine days and nine nights and would reach the earth upon the tenth day. Were it to continue its course toward the abode of darkness, it would be nine days and nine nights more in accomplishing the distance. Anaximander, four hundred years after Homer, held that the earth, instead of being flat, was in the form of a cylinder, convex upon its upper surface. Its diameter was three times greater than its height, and its form was round, as if it had been shaped by a turner's lathe. The oracle of Delphi was the center of his system. At a period which is no longer possible to settle with precision, but certainly anterior to 5th century BC, the Carthaginians, then in the height of their maritime and commercial prosperity, ordered a navigator by the name of Hanno to make a voyage beyond the Pillars of Hercules and to found cities along the western shore of Africa. He set sail with a fleet of sixty vessels, each of which was impelled by fifty oars. He carried with him thirty thousand men and women with abundant supplies and provisions. The narrative, as given by Hanno himself, hardly fills two octavo pages. Volumes of commentaries have been written upon it by geographers and antiquaries. The most probable of the various hypotheses formed upon it is that Hanno's voyage extended to Sherbro Sound, a little south of Sierra Leone. The features of man and nature, as described by Hanno, are to be found in tropical Africa only. End of section 3《Section Three》。《Section Four of Science History of the Universe, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel.《The Science History of the Universe, Volume Two. Edited by Francis Walt Wheeler. Geology, Chapter Two: The Beginnings of Cartography, Part Two. While Hanno was thus exploring the western coast of Africa, another Carthaginian named Himlikon was sent by his countrymen to the north of Europe. From a very vague description of his voyage, given in a Latin poem entitled *Ora Maritima*. It is plain that he crossed the Bay of Biscay and found upon islands, as is asserted, but probably upon the mainland, 
a race of athletic people who went fearlessly to sea in barks made of skins sewed together. They crossed, in the space of two days, to a place called the Sacred Island, Ireland, which is not far from another island named Albion, England. No further details of this expedition have been preserved. A colony which had been established at Massilia, now Marseille, about 600 years before Christ by the Phoenicians was, in the year 340 B.C., at the height of its commercial prosperity. The citizens, being desirous of extending their maritime relations, sent at this period upon an expedition to the north of Europe, through the Pillars of Hercules, a learned geographer and astronomer by the name of Pythias. He started with a single ship. He passed the Pillars on the 16th day from Massilia, and on the twentieth day he arrived at the sacred promontory, the extreme western point of Iberia or Spain. A temple to Hercules had been erected at this spot. The inhabitants of the promontory declared during the time of Pythias, and indeed for two hundred years afterwards, that as the sun plunged at evening into the sea, they heard a hissing like that of a red-hot body suddenly dropped into water. Following the coasts of Iberia and of Celtica, he came to the point of land now known as Finisterra in France and the promontory Calbium. Turning east, he was surprised to find himself in a wide gulf, with Celtica on his right and an immense island on his left. The gulf was the British Channel, and the island, the Albion, that Himlacon had vaguely described some centuries before. It was at this point that Pythias may be said to have begun his career, and the discovery of Great Britain may safely be attributed to him. He described the island as having the form of an isosceles triangle. Three promontories formed the three right angles. Valerium, being now Land's End, Cantinum, Cape Pepernus, and Orcus, Duncan's Head. He found the inhabitants of the southern coast industrious and sociable, peaceable, honest, and sober. They raised wheat and worked rich mines of tin. As he sailed northward along the eastern coast, he noted that the days grew sensibly longer, and at Point Orcas nineteen hours elapsed between the rising and setting of the sun. He sailed still northward, and six days after leaving Orcas, he came to an island or continent, he knew not which, which he called Thule. As he found he could go no further to the north, he spoke of the spot as Ultima Thule, an expression which has passed into the figurative language of all modern nations as one denoting any remote point. Thule is generally considered to have been Shetland, although theories have been ardently advocated, making it respectively Iceland, Sweden, and Jutland. The narrative of Pythias, which has been thus far clear and reliable, assumes at this point a fabulous aspect. He declares that north of Thule there was neither earth, nor sea, nor air, a sort of dense concretion of all the elements occupied space and enveloped the world. He compared it to the thick, viscid animal substance called pulo marinus, a sort of mollusk or medusa. He said that this substance was the basis of the universe, and that in it earth, air, and sky hung, as it were, suspended. This illusion has been explained by the dreary spectacle of fogs, mists, rains, and tempests, which at this point of his voyage must have met the gaze of the daring navigator. It would have been difficult for any mind in those early ages to have been on its guard against the sinister impressions likely to result from the contemplation of a scene so appalling. It must be remembered that Pythias was accustomed to the pure and transparent atmosphere, the dazzling sky, and the phosphorescent waters of the Mediterranean. It would have been astonishing if a man educated among the splendors of an almost tropical climate had not been oppressed by influences so gloomy. In the year 863, a Dane of Swedish origin, named Gardar, adventurously pushed off into the northern ocean, discovered the rock island whose appropriate name is Iceland. Eleven years later, a navigator named Ingolf colonized the country. The colonists many of whom belonged to the most esteemed families in the north, establishing a flourishing republic. In 877, a sailor named Gunbjorn saw a mountainous coast far to the west, supposed to be now concealed or rendered inaccessible by the descent of Arctic ice. 
Eric the Red, who had been banished from Norway for murder and had settled in Iceland, was in his turn outlawed thence in 983. He sailed to the west and discovered a land which he called Greenland, because, as he said, people will be attracted hither if the land has a good name. He returned to Iceland, and in the year 985, a large number of ships, according to some authorities, 35, followed him to the new settlement and established themselves on its southwestern shore. In 986, Bjarni Herjolfsson Bjarni, son of Herjulf, in a voyage from Iceland to Greenland, was driven a long distance from the accustomed track. Various data furnished by this narrative in the original Iceland records have enabled geographers to determine the various coasts dimly seen by Bjarni, but upon which he did not land. They are supposed to have been those of Long Island, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. In the year 994, Leif Erikson, Leif the son of Eric the outlaw, bought Bjarni's ship and engaged 35 men to navigate it, as he intended to sail upon a voyage of discovery. He asked his father, Eric, to be the captain, but Eric declined being, as he said, well stricken in years. They sailed away into the sea and discovered first the land which Bjarni had discovered last. They went ashore, saw no grass but plenty of icebergs and an abundance of flat stones. From the latter circumstance they named the place Heluland, Helu signifying a flat stone. There can be no doubt that the spot thus named is the modern Newfoundland. They went on board again and proceeded on their way. They went ashore a second time, where the land was flat and covered with wood and white sand. This, said Leif, shall be named after its qualities and called Markland, Woodland. Again embarking and sailing to the south, they reached Vinland, so called because of the wild grapes. This was probably the first recorded landing on the eastern shore of what is now the United States. Thus beginning from a fearful restraint of venturing upon the sea, the ancients first explored the Mediterranean, then, growing bolder, ventured beyond the Straits of Gibraltar and crept along the African coast and up toward the north of Europe. The perils of the open ocean were first dared by the Norsemen, to whom is due the honor of having first landed upon and truly discovered the continent of America, an honor furthered by Columbus, Amerigo Vespucci, and later navigators. The next great event was the doubling of the Cape of Good Hope by Bartholomew Diaz in 1486. He had indeed doubled it without knowing it, for having taken a wide sweep to sea after a long southern voyage, and on again making for the land, he could find none. Only on turning to a more northerly course did he see land 100 miles to the eastward of the formidable Cape which never before had been passed. It avails little to tell the voyage of Columbus and his discovery of the West Indies in 1492, or the curious circumstances which led to the use of Amerigo's name. The Florentines were eager to have Amerigo's work recognized, and when a Frenchman of saint D republished his narrative, making an error in the date which made it seem that Amerigo preceded Columbus, Florence took it up, and Spain made no protest in favor of Columbus, whom she had allowed to die in punery and disgrace. Sebastian Cabot, a true navigator, discovered Hudson's Bay in 1518. Vasco da Gama, in 1497, followed the track of Bartholomew Diaz and reached India by doubling the Cape of Good Hope. It did not occur to him, however, to continue his journey, and in returning to Portugal he retraced his path. In 1519, Ferdinand Magellan found the straits between the Atlantic and the Pacific, which are known as the Magellan Straits to this day. With the Atlantic and the Pacific thus laid open, navigators followed close upon each other's heels, and scarce a year passed that did not see some portion of ocean crossed or some new point of coastline chartered. The circumnavigation of the world speedily became a matter of no comment, and the once appalling ocean became as familiar a highway as a city street. Exploration, in the true sense of the word, thereafter was mainly devoted to land expeditions, which were of great physiographical benefit when the large continents were first crossed. Thus the Spaniards, in the south of North America and in Mexico and Peru, added vastly to the world's knowledge. Likewise in Africa, the names of such men as Mungo Park, Speak, Grant, Livingston, and Stanley are to be remembered, 
and in Australia, the first man to cross the continent, John McDowell Stewart, in 1862. But modern exploration has been devoted mainly to polar search, and now that late in the summer of 1909 the announcement is made that the North Pole has been reached, and Lieutenant Perry has brought back the records of his valuable trip, it may be well to point out the northward progress of successor polar expeditions. In the reign of Henry VIII, Dr. Robert Thorne declared that if he had faculty to his will, the first thing he would understand, even to attempt, would be if our seas northward are navigable to the pole or no. Accordingly, two fair ships set forth on May 1527. One was wrecked off Newfoundland, the other does not seem to have returned. A similar fate met Sir Hugh Willoughby, who left in 1563, who lost one vessel on the Muscovy coast, and who, with all his companions, perished miserably in Lapland. Martin Forbisher, the great navigator, reached latitude 63 degrees as his most northerly point, and in 1585 Captain John Davis reached latitude 80 degrees, and on a third voyage pushed even farther, reaching a point he named Cape Sanderson. Henry Hudson, the explorer of the Hudson River, whose tricennial discovery of the Hudson River, coupled with the celebration of Robert Fulton in September and October 1909, brought representatives to New York from all civilized countries to do them honor, was also one of the furthest North men. In 1607, in an attempt to reach the Pacific by the long-sought Northwest Passage, he attained the latitude of 81 degrees. The last of the early explorers was William Baffin, who, with Robert Bylot, in 1615, sailed around Greenland, giving his name to Baffin Bay. The 19th century was remarkable for strenuous endeavor. In 1818, Sir John Perry overtopped all earlier efforts and reached as far north as 82 degrees. The hopes of the world, however, rose high when, in the spring of 1845, Sir John Franklin sailed for polar waters. The silence of the Arctic winter fell over the expedition, and rescue parties later found the bodies of Franklin and his men, who had died in forwarding their quest. Scarcely less tragic was the loss of the American De Long expedition in 1881. The great figure in polar work during the 19th century unquestionably was Commander Robert E. Perry, who in 1886 first attacked the Arctic terrors. His first expedition was to Greenland, and from that time he has been almost constantly in the Arctic region under the auspices of several learned and scientific societies. But in spite of his indefatigable efforts, a Norwegian, Dr. Nansen, carried off the banner for the highest point reached in the 19th century. He built a vessel to withstand ice pressure and trusted that the currents would carry him to the pole. He reached latitude 86 degrees 14 minutes and brought back a mass of extremely useful scientific information. An attempt to reach the North Pole by balloon was made by Professor Andre in 1897. The expedition was never heard from, for aerial navigation had not then made the wonderful advances compassed in the first decade of the 20th century. The last year of the century saw the northern mark again pushed forward. An expedition under the command of the Duke of Abruzzi sailed in 1899. Dr. Nansen's furthest point was passed, and a dash was being made for the pole when the leader of the expedition was severely frostbitten, and he transferred the command to Captain Cagney, who reached the point of latitude 86 degrees 34 minutes. Two important Arctic expeditions may be mentioned. The Ziegler expedition commanded by Anthony Fiala in 1903 and that of Captain Admanson. Fiala spent two years above the 81st parallel and added greatly to polar knowledge, and Admanson achieved the long-sought feat of the Northwest Passage in the little ship Goa. Early in September 1909, Dr. Frederick A. Cook cabled news that he had reached the North Pole. The unexpectedness of the report and the fact that the traveler was known to be far less elaborately equipped than most polar explorers caused the news at first to be received with a great deal of hesitation in scientific circles. Far other was the reception accorded the news received a week later 
that Lieutenant Perry had reached the Pole, touching the coveted spot on April 6, 1909. The priority of Dr. Cook's claim, duly substantiated, would be indisputable, but would be of less scientific value by reason of the less adequate facilities he possessed for meteorological, geographical, and astronomical observations. Whether first by Dr. Cook or by Lieutenant Perry, two facts stand out clearly high above all the rest, that the North Pole has been reached and that the first flag to fly there was the Stars and Stripes. But one quest remains for the explorer, the South Pole, and the year 1909 is as memorable in Antarctic as in Arctic discovery. In one of the finest ice journeys ever made, Lieutenant E. H. Shackleton of the British Navy planted the Union Jack at 88 degrees 23 minutes south, or but 111 miles from the South Pole, the flag being hoisted on January 9, 1909. Thus, in the same year, an American and an Englishman stood almost at the two poles of the earth, practically completing the exploration of the world. End of chapter 2 Section 5 of The Science History of the Universe Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina The Science History of the Universe Volume 2 Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler Geology Chapter 3. Geology and the Church. Part 1. The decline of the Roman Empire, while, as has been seen, it did not prevent the growth of the adventurous spirit, was a sore blow to scientific study. Life was too insecure to permit leisure, and the governmental situation was uncertain in all countries. From the middle of the 8th century onward, for some 500 years, the Arabs alone kept alive the feeble flame of interest and researches into the secrets of nature. With great labor and at large cost, they procured as much as they could obtain of the literature of ancient Greece and Rome, and studied and translated into their own language the works of the best writers in philosophy, medicine, mathematics, and astronomy. They were thus able to some extent to enlarge the domain of these subjects. But geology was a subject to which the students of the caliphates never took kindly. Albert the Great, 1205 through 1280 A.D., the most learned man of his time, mentions that a branch of a tree was found on which was a bird's nest containing birds, the whole being solid stone. He accounted for this strange phenomenon by the vis formativa of Aristotle, an occult force which, according to the prevalent notions of the time, was capable of forming most of the extraordinary objects discovered in the earth. One of the keenest observers, whose opinions have been recorded, was the illustrious painter, architect, sculptor, and engineer, Leonardo da Vinci, 1452-1519. through 1519. His attention having been aroused by the abundantly fossiliferous nature of some of the rocks in northern Italy, in which canals were cut, he concluded that the shells contained in these rocks had once been living on the sea floor and had been buried in the silt washed off the neighboring land. He ridiculed the notion that they could have been produced by the influence of the stars, and he asked where such an influence could be shown to be at work now. But he pointed out that besides the shells, there were at various heights 
terraces of gravel composed of materials that had evidently been rounded and accumulated by moving water. The Neapolitan Alessandro degli Alessandri, 1461-1523, through 1523, mentions petrified conchilia in the Calabrian mountains and ascribes their presence to an inundation of the continent by the ocean caused by some exceptional catastrophe or by a change in the axis of rotation of the earth. Fracastoro, in the year 1517, gave clear expression to his convictions about fossils, which were in accordance with those of Leonardo da Vinci. During the building of the citadel of San Felice in Verona, the workers found fossil mussels in the rocks and laid them before Fracastoro, begging him to explain the marvel. Fracastoro repudiated the doctrine of a vis plastica in the earth as impossible, and just as little did he give credence to the view that explained fossils as creatures left by the great flood. The flood, he said, was of short duration, and in the nature of things, it would have left not marine but fresh water mussels behind. Further, on the assumption that the mussels had been carried from the ocean to the land by the flood, their remains would have been scattered over the surface of the land and would not have been buried deep in the earth where the quarrymen had found them. There was left, he continued, only one possible explanation, that the fossils were the remains of animals which had once lived in the localities where their remains are now embedded. Far more illustrious than the majority of his contemporaries in science was George Bauer, better known by his nom de plume of Agricola. Werner calls him the father of metallurgy and the originator of the critical study of minerals. Agricola's observations on crystalline form, cleavage, hardness, weight, color, luster, etc., have served as a model for all subsequent descriptions of minerals. On the other hand, Agricola's remarks about fossils are of much less value. He had devoted little attention to the fossil remains of animals and plants, and he unfortunately united, under the name Fossilia, both minerals and petrified organisms. This use of the term fossils was perpetuated for two centuries in the literature, having been more especially adopted by the famous Wernerian school. Giulio Cardano, 1552, pointed to fossil shells as certain evidence that the sea once covered the sites of the hills. His contemporary, Mattioli, on the other hand, supported the old figment of the Materia Pinguis, though admitting that porous bodies, such as the bones and shells, so abundant in Italy, might be turned into stone by being permeated by a petrifying juice. He is said to have been the first writer who published a reference to the fossil fishes of Monte Bolca. The skillful anatomist, Gabriel Fallopio, 1562, when he met with bones of elephants, teeth of sharks, shells, and other fossils, refused to admit them to be anything but earthy concretions, because he deemed that to be a simpler solution of the problem than to suppose that the waters of the deluge could have reached as far as Italy. Olivi of Cremona, in 1584, writes of the fossil conchilia of the famous Calciolarian collection in Verona as mere sports of nature. Michel Mercati prepared good illustrations of fossil bivalves, ammonites, and nummulites in the museum of Pope Sixtus V, 
and these were published between 1717 and 1719 in the Metaloteca Vaticana by Lancisi, the physician of Pope Clement XI. Mercati names the fossils according to Pliny, and after long discussion comes to the conclusion that they took origin under the influence of the stars. It is astonishing to find how tenaciously, until the middle of the 18th century, so many authors clung to such absurd ideas, even although the fossils were being made known by means of good illustrations to an ever-increasing number of observers. The works of Aldrovandi, Athanasius, Kircher the Jesuit, Sebastian Kirkmeyer, Alberti, Balbini, Geyer, Hartley, and many others in the 17th century contained good figures and extended the knowledge of the fossils found in various European localities. The fossils were, however, treated usually as mineral curiosities or as illusions of nature, sometimes as forms called forth in the earth by vis plastica, or some other force, sometimes compared with living mussels, snails, sea urchins, and plants, and named accordingly. In the crowd of writers who took part in the long geological controversy, by far the most illustrious was Nicolas Steno, 1631-1687. Born and educated in Copenhagen, he traveled to Leiden, Paris, and Austria, and eventually settled in Florence as physician to the Grand Duke Ferdinand II. While here, he renounced Protestantism for Romanism. Shortly after this, he was persuaded to return to his native land, where his religious beliefs caused him so much unpleasantness that he went back to Florence and was made a bishop. He wrote much on theology and anatomy, but it is his writings in geology which won for him the high position among scientists accorded him by posterity. In 1669, there appeared in Florence his treatise De Solido Intra Soliam Naturaliter Contento which must be regarded as one of the landmarks in the history of geological investigation. In this, he says that the strata of the earth are such as would be laid down in the form of sediment from turbid water, the objects enclosed in them, which in every respect resemble plants and animals, were produced exactly in the same way as living plants and animals are produced now where any bed encloses either fragments of another and therefore older bed or the remains of plants or animals, it cannot be as old as the time of the creation. If any marine production is found in any of these strata, it proves that at one time the sea has been present there, while if the enclosed remains are those terrestrial plants or animals, the sediment must have been laid down on land by some river or torrent. Steno's treatise stands out far above all the writings of his own or of previous generations in respect to the minuteness and accuracy of his observations of nature and the originality and truth of most of the deductions which he drew from them. He was the first, clearly, to perceive that the strata of the Earth's crust contain the records of a chronological sequence of events, and that the history of the Earth must be deciphered from them. He laid down for the first time some of the fundamental principles of stratigraphy. Another notable Italian writer, Anton Lazzaro Moro, appeared in the first half of the 18th century. A large part of Moro's work is devoted to a destructive criticism of the cosmogonies of two of his contemporaries, 
he discussed the possibility of explaining the position of fossil shells in the mountains by reference to the Noachian deluge, and dismissed this supposition as untenable. After giving an account of the uprise of a new volcanic island in the Greek archipelago in the year 1707, of the appearance of Monte Nuovo near Naples in 1538, and of the recorded eruptions of Vesuvius and Etna, and starting with the proposition that the fossil shells are really productions of the sea, he proceeds to unfold his theory that the position of these shells and the origin of the rocks that enclose them are to be assigned to the operation of volcanic action. In the beginning, he says, the globe was completely covered with water, which was then fresh and perhaps not more than 175 perches in depth. No prominences diversified the smooth, stony surface of the globe, which underlay the water. On the third day of creation, however, when it pleased the Almighty to reveal the solid earth, Vast subterranean fires were kindled, whereby the surface of stone was broken up, and huge masses of it began to appear above the water, so as to form the land and mountains. These disrupted masses, while rising, or after they had risen, and in some cases even before they appeared above the water, were rent open by the violence of the subterranean fires and they discharged from their orifices vast quantities of material, such as earth, sand, clay, stones, both solid and liquid, metals, sulfur, salts, bitumen, and every kind of mineral substance. Part of this material flowed in river-like streams down the sides of the mountains into the water below, part fell in showers from the air, into which the ejected detritus had been hurled by the impetuosity of the fire. The saline and bituminous ingredients now began to give to the water the salt and bitter taste which the sea has retained ever since, while the other insoluble substances formed a new bottom above the original stony surface. As yet, no plants or animals existed, but while the water continued to grow more saline, plants began at last to appear, both in the sea and on land. Animals, too, entered upon the scene, first in the sea, living in the soft sand and among the debris cast out by the mountains, and seldom wandering far from their native places. The dry land became covered with verdure and gave birth to terrestrial animals, finally followed by the advent of man, who then took his place as an inhabitant of this first and most ancient land surface. In course of time, the same sequence of events continuing, new mountains emerged from the bosom of the earth, and like their predecessors, vomited forth fresh materials, which were once more spread out over the floor of the sea and the surface of the land. The strata that were thus deposited in the sea would contain marine productions, while those formed on the land would preserve terrestrial remains, including articles in metal, marble, or carved wood, as relics of a human population. Some of these land surfaces, remaining long exposed to the open air, were covered with new strata, which, when they differed in composition from those buried below them, would produce plants and animals distinct from any of those which had previously existed on the same sites. And since the newer strata were not all laid down universally and at the same time, but successively, during the course of centuries, and at different seasons of the year, 
seeds and fruits in mature and immature condition would be entombed, as may be illustrated by many examples that have actually been obtained from excavations, in which, at different levels, old soils represent inhabited and cultivated surfaces of land. Moro had to take care that his cosmogony did not contradict, but only supplemented the orthodox reading of the first chapter of the book of Genesis. The following semi-tragic, semi-comic event was a decided setback to the prevailing belief in the theory of the direct origin of fossils, that is, that they were imitations produced in the rocks by some unknown causes. Johannes Bartholomew Beringer, a professor in the University of Würzburg, published in 1726 a paleontological work entitled Lithographia Virsheborgensis. In it, a number of true fossils were illustrated, belonging to the Muskel Cock or Middle Trias of North Bavaria, and beside these were more or less remarkable forms, even sun, moon, stars, and Hebraic letters, said to be fossils, and described and illustrated as such by the professor. As a matter of fact, his students, who no longer believed in the Greek myth of self-generation in the rocks, had placed artificially concocted forms in the earth, and during excursions had unveiled the credulous professor to those particular spots and discovered them. But when at last Beringer's own name was found apparently in fossil form in the rocks, the mystery was revealed to the unfortunate professor. He tried to buy up and destroy his published work, but in 1767 a new edition of the work was published, and the book is preserved as a scientific curiosity. Many of the false fossils, Lutigenstein, may be seen in the mineral collections at Bamberg, and there are also specimens in the university collections of Würzburg, Munich, and other places. Palissy, a French writer on the origin of springs from rainwater and of other scientific works, undertook in 1580 to combat the notions of many of his contemporaries in Italy that petrified shells had all been deposited by the universal deluge. He was the first, said Fontenelle, when, in the French Academy, he pronounced his eulogy nearly a century and a half later, quote, Who dared assert in Paris that fossil remains of testacea and fish had once belonged to marine animals? Unquote. Palissy's ideas were violently attacked by his compatriots and he was denounced as a heretic in his philosophical and scientific writings, just as he was a Huguenot and a heretic in his religion. End of Section 5、section、six of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Geology. Chapter three. Geology and the Church. Part two. Next among the notable workers was the versatile B. F. Guitard, who traveled through France, England, Germany, and Poland, and whose great desire it was to reproduce his scientific observations on maps. Gotthard's mineralogical map of France and England 
gives so much accurate information regarding the local occurrence of rocks and minerals and the position of mines, quarries, fossil localities, mineral springs, hot springs, and coal, that it can still be used with advantage. The map is not colored. Gotard described the processes of land denudation effected by the solvent and destructive agency of rain and rivers, and by the abrasion of the waves. This is probably the first paper in which a systematic account of denudation is given in its relation to changes in the configuration of the Earth's surface. The most brilliant of Gotthard's achievements was his discovery of the volcanic rocks in the Auvergne region. Nicolas Desmarest, a French professor, opposed Gotthard's erroneous conception that the Auvergne basalt pillars had crystallized from a watery fluid and demonstrated the resemblance of the Auvergne basalt to certain recent lavas. He was supported by F. de Saint-Fond, 1742-1819, professor in the Museum of Natural History in Paris, who brought forward conclusive evidences of the igneous origin of basalt. Toward the close of the 18th century, the idea of distinguishing the mineral masses on our globe into separate groups and studying their relations began to be generally diffused. Of these investigators, Pallas and Saussure were among the most celebrated whose labors contributed to this end. After an attentive examination of the two great mountain chains of Siberia, Pallas announced the result that the granitic rocks were in the middle, the schistos at their sides, and the limestones again on the outside of these, and this he conceived would prove a general law in the formation of all chains composed chiefly of primary rocks. In his Travels in Russia in 1793 and 1794, he made many geological observations on the recent strata near the Volga and the Caspian, and adduced proofs of the greater extent of the latter sea at no distant era in the Earth's history. His memoir on the fossil bones of Siberia attracted attention to some of the most remarkable phenomena of geology. He stated that he had found a rhinoceros entire in the frozen soil with its skin and flesh, an elephant found afterward and a mass of ice on the shore of the North Sea removed all doubt as to the accuracy of such a remarkable discovery. The subjects relating to natural history, which engaged the attention of Pallas, were too multifarious to admit of his devoting a large share of his labors exclusively to geology. Saussure, on the other hand, employed the chief portion of his time in studying the structure of the Alps and Jura, and he provided valuable data for those who followed him. Chirini, in 1676, contended that the diluvian waters could not have conveyed heavy bodies to the summit of mountains, since the agitation of the sea never extended to great depths, and still less could the testacea as some pretended, have lived in these diluvian waters, for, quote, the duration of the flood was brief, and the heavy rains must have destroyed the saltness of the sea, end quote. He was the first writer who ventured to maintain that the universality of the Noachian cataclysm ought not to be insisted upon. The great mathematician Leibniz published his Proto-Gaia in 1680. He imagined this planet to have been originally a burning, luminous mass, which, ever since its creation, has been undergoing refrigeration. When the outer crust had cooled down sufficiently to allow the vapors to be condensed, 
they fell and formed a universal ocean, covering the loftiest mountains and investing the whole globe. The crust, as it consolidated from a state of fusion, assumed a vesicular and cavernous structure, and, being rent in some places, allowed the water to rush into the subterranean hollows, whereby the level of the primeval ocean was lowered. The breaking in of these vast caverns is supposed to have given rise to the dislocated and deranged position of the strata, which Steno had described, and the same disruptions communicated violent movements to the incumbent waters, whence great inundations ensued. The waters, after they had been thus agitated, deposited their sedimentary matter during intervals of quiescence, and hence the various stony and earthy strata. We may recognize, therefore, says Leibniz, a double origin of primitive masses, the one by refrigeration from igneous fusion, the other by concretion from aqueous solution. By the repetition of similar causes, the disruption of the crust and consequent floods, alternations of new strata were produced, until at length these causes were reduced to a condition of quiescent equilibrium, and a more permanent state of things was established. Robert Hooke, 1635-1703, through 1703, was one of the most brilliant, ingenious, and versatile intellects of the 17th century. Among the many subjects to which he directed his attention and on which his remarkable powers of acute observation and sagacious reflection enabled him to cast light, some of the more important problems of geology must be numbered. In 1705 appeared the Posthumous Works of Robert Hooke, M.D., which contained a discourse on earthquakes. However trivial a thing, he says, a rotten shell may appear to some, yet these monuments of nature are more certain tokens of antiquity than coins or medals, since the best of those may be counterfeited or made by art and design, as may also books, manuscripts, and inscriptions, as all the learned are now sufficiently satisfied has often been actually practiced and though it must be granted that it is very difficult to read them, the records of nature, and to raise a chronology out of them, and to state the intervals of the time wherein such catastrophes and mutations have happened, yet it is not impossible. He accounts for the shells found in mountains by saying that such things may be due to the action of earthquakes. Quote, which have turned plains into mountains, and mountains into plains, seas into land, and land into seas, made rivers where there were none before, and swallowed up others that formerly were, and which, since the creation of the world, have brought many great changes on the superficial parts of the earth, and have been the instruments of placing shells, bones, plants, fishes, and the like, in those places where, with much astonishment, we find them. End quote. About 1690 appeared Thomas Burnett's Theory of the Earth. The title is characteristic of the age, The Sacred Theory of the Earth, containing an account of the original of the earth and of all the general changes which it had already undergone or is to undergo till the consummation of all things. Even Milton had scarcely ventured in his poem to indulge his imagination so freely in painting scenes of the creation and deluge, paradise and chaos. He explained why the primeval earth enjoyed a perpetual spring before the flood, showed how the crust of the globe was fissured by the sun's rays, so that it burst, and thus the diluvial waters were let loose 
from a supposed central abyss. Not satisfied with these themes, he derived from the books of the inspired writers, and even from heathen authorities, prophetic views of the future revolutions of the globe, gave a most terrific description of the general conflagration, and proved that a new heaven and a new earth will rise out of a second chaos, after which will follow the blessed millennium. The celebrated naturalist John Ray, 1627-1705, through 1705, participated in the same desire to explain geological phenomena by reference to causes less hypothetical than those usually resorted to. In his essay on Chaos and Creation, he proposed the system, agreeing in its outline and in many of its details with that of Hooke, but his knowledge of natural history enabled him to elucidate the subject with various original observations. Earthquakes, he suggested, might have been the second causes employed at the creation in separating the land from the waters and in gathering the waters together into one place. He mentions, like Hook, the earthquake of 1646, which had violently shaken the Andes for some hundreds of leagues and made many alterations therein. In assigning a cause for the general deluge, he preferred a change in the Earth's center of gravity to the introduction of earthquakes. Some unknown cause, he said, might have forced the subterranean waters outward, as was perhaps indicated by, quote, the breaking up of the fountains of the great deep, end quote. Among the contemporaries of Hook and Ray, John Woodward, 1665 through 1722, a professor of medicine, had acquired the most extensive information respecting the geological structure of the crust of the earth. He had examined many parts of the British strata with minute attention, and his systematic collection of specimens, bequeathed to the University of Cambridge and still preserved there as arranged by him, shows how far he had advanced in ascertaining the order of superposition. He conceived, quote, the whole terrestrial globe to have been taken to pieces and dissolved at the flood, and the strata to have settled down from this promiscuous mass as any earthy sediments from a fluid. End quote. In corroboration of these views, he insisted upon the fact that quote, marine bodies are lodged in the strata according to the order of their gravity the heavier shells in stone, the lighter in chalk, and so of the rest, end quote. Ray immediately exposed the unfounded nature of this assertion, remarking truly that fossil bodies are often mingled heavy with light in the same stratum. And he even went so far as to say that Woodward, quote, must have invented the phenomena for the sake of confirming his bold and strange hypothesis, end quote. a strong expression from the pen of a contemporary. It is interesting to turn from the physico-theological disputes of the Germans and English to follow the steps of the Italians and witness the real progress they were making at this time, the while that they refuted and ridiculed the theories of Burnett Woodward and Ray. An illustrious observer in the geological domain appeared in Italy when Steno, in his twenty-fifth year, was rapidly rising into fame as an anatomist. Antonio Valisneri, 1661-1730, through 1730, became professor of medicine in Padua. In the course of his journeys, he had opportunities of seeing much of the geology of his native country and of forming a clearer conception of the fossiliferous formations of the great central mountain chain than any one had done before him. His works were rich in original observations. 
he attempted the first general sketch of the marine deposits of Italy, their geographical extents, and most characteristic organic remains. In his treatise on the origin of springs, he explained their dependence on the order and often on the dislocations of the strata, and reasoned philosophically against the opinions of those who regarded the disordered state of the earth's crust as exhibiting signs of the wrath of God for the sins of man. Although reluctant to generalize on the rich materials accumulated in his travels, Valisneri had been so much struck with the remarkable continuity of the more recent marine strata from one end of Italy to the other, that he came to the conclusion that the ocean formerly extended over the whole earth, and after abiding there for a long time, had gradually subsided. The last, and not the least, of the cosmogonists was G. L. Leclerc de Buffon, 1707-1788, through 1788, one of the greatest pioneers who figured so conspicuously in the history of France. At first interested in physics and mathematics, he gradually broadened his field of observation, taking in the whole realm of nature. He adopted the theory of an original volcanic nucleus, together with the universal ocean of Leibniz. By this aqueous envelope, the highest mountains were once covered. Marine currents then acted violently and formed horizontal strata by washing away solid matter in some parts and depositing it in others. They also excavated deep submarine valleys. The level of the ocean was then depressed by the entrance of a part of its waters into subterranean caverns, and thus some land was left dry. Soon after the publication of his Natural History, in which was included his Theory of the Earth, he received an official letter, dated January 1751, from the Sorbonne, or Faculty of Theology in Paris, informing him that fourteen propositions in his works Quote, were reprehensible and contrary to the creed of the church. End quote. The first of these obnoxious passages, and the only one relating to geology, was as follows quote, The waters of the sea have produced the mountains and valleys of the land. The waters of the heavens, reducing all to a level, will at last deliver the whole land over to the sea, and the sea, successively prevailing over the land, will leave dry new continents, like those which we inhabit. End quote. Buffon was invited by the college in courteous terms to send in an explanation, or rather a recantation of his unorthodox opinions. To this he submitted, and a general assembly of the faculty, having approved of his declaration, he was required to publish it in his next work. The grand principle which Buffon was called upon to renounce was simply this, quote, that the present mountains and valleys of the earth were due to secondary causes, and that the same causes will in time destroy all the continents, hills, and valleys, and reproduce others like them, end quote. Now, whatever may be the defects of many of his views, it is no longer controverted that the present continents are of secondary origin. The doctrine is as firmly established as the earth's rotation on its axis, and that the land now elevated above the level of the sea will not endure forever is an opinion which gains ground daily in proportion as experience of the changes now in progress is enlarged. Tagione, 1751, opposed Buffon in his theory 
regarding the origin of valleys. Buffon attributed them principally to submarine currents, while the Tuscan naturalist labored to show that both the larger and smaller valleys of the Apennines were excavated by rivers and floods, caused by the bursting of the barriers of lakes after the retreat of the ocean. He was a contemporary of Werner, who ushers in a new era. End of Section 6 Section 7 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Geology, Chapter 4, Werner and Hutton, Part 1. With the freeing of geological study from the trammels of ecclesiasticism arose a rejuvenating significance in the determined spirit that prevailed to discountenance speculation and to seek untiringly in the field and the laboratories after new observations, new truths. Interest was directed, in the first place, toward the investigation and description of the accessible parts of the Earth's crust. The composition and arrangement of the strata were studied with enthusiasm, the bolder inquirers ventured into wild recesses of mountain chains and climbed snowy peaks, whose difficulties had hitherto been thought insurmountable. Travelers explored the uninhabited plains of Siberia, the remote mountain ranges of Asia and America, and brought home with them new scientific material and observations of the highest importance for comparative research. Together with this arose the realization of the value of understanding the works of the geologists of the past— for the first time, a history of geology became possible. As Sir Archibald Geikie said, in no department of natural knowledge is the adoption of this historical method more necessary and useful than it is in geology. The subjects with which that branch of science deals are, for the most part, not susceptible of mathematical treatment. The conclusions formed in regard to them, being often necessarily incapable of rigid demonstration, must rest on a balance of probabilities. There is thus room for some difference of opinion both as to facts and the interpretation of them. Deductions and inferences which are generally accepted in one age may be rejected in the next. This element of uncertainty has tended to encourage speculation. Moreover, the subjects of investigation are themselves often calculated powerfully to excite the imagination. Quote, the story of this earth since it became a habitable globe, the evolution of its continents, the birth and degradation of its mountains, the marvelous procession of plants and animals which, since the beginning of time, has passed over its surface, these and a thousand cognate themes with which geology deals have attracted numbers of readers and workers to its pale, have kindled much general interest and awakened not a little enthusiasm. But the records from which the chronicle of events must be compiled are sadly deficient and fragmentary. The deductions which they suggest ought frequently to be held in suspense from want of evidence. Yet with a certain class of minds fancy comes in to supply the place of facts that fail. And thus geology has been encumbered with many hypotheses and theories which, plausible as they might seem at the time of their promulgation, have one by one been dissipated before the advance of fuller and more accurate knowledge. Yet before their overthrow it may often be hard to separate the actual ascertained core of fact within them from the mass of erroneous interpretation and unfounded inference that forms most of their substance. End quote. The modern period begins with the advent of a man who bulks far more largely in the history of geology than any of those with whom up to the present we have been concerned, a man who wielded an enormous authority over the mineralogy and geology of his day. Through the loyal devotion of his pupils, he was elevated even in his lifetime to the position of a kind of scientific pope, whose decisions were final on any subject regarding which he chose to pronounce them. During the last quarter of the eighteenth century, by far the most notable figure in the ranks of those who cultivated the study of minerals and rocks was unquestionably Abraham Gottlob Werner, 1749 to 1817. 
The vast influence which this man wielded arose mainly from his personal gifts and character, and especially from the overmastering power he had of impressing his opinions upon the conviction of his hearers. Werner was born in 1749 at Weren, in Upper Lapatia, of a family which had long been interested in the iron industry. Thus from infancy he was in intimate contact with people interested in topics akin to geology. He early became interested in mineralogy, and his tendency in this direction was encouraged by his father. The latter desired his assistance in the smelting houses at Weren, but the boy's ambition to devote himself to minerals had taken too deep root, and he decided to go to the riding academy at Freiburg. He was a most ardent student, and all his spare moments were spent in neighboring mines. In 1771 he went to the University of Leipzig, where he prosecuted the study of law for two years, but eventually returned to his first love, mineralogy. When only twenty-five years of age he published a book on minerals, then a wonder of arrangement, largely as a result of which he was appointed to the post of professor of mineralogy in the School of Mines at Freiburg, where he had formerly studied. His manner of discourse also was so attractive and stimulating that he riveted the attention of his pupils, incited them to pursue the studies that he loved, and fired them with a desire to apply his methods. Ostensibly he had to teach mineralogy, a science which in ordinary hands can hardly be said to evoke enthusiasm. But Werner's mineralogy embraced the whole of nature, the whole of human history, the whole interests and pursuits and tendencies of mankind. From a few pieces of stone placed almost at random on the table before him, he would launch out into an exposition of the influence of minerals and rocks upon the geography and topography of the earth's surface. He would contrast the mountain scenery of the granites and schists with the tamer landscapes of the sandstones and limestones. Tracing the limits of these contrasts of surface over the area of Europe, he would dwell on their influence upon the grouping and characteristics of the nations. He would connect, in this way, his specimens with the migration of races, the spread of languages, the progress of civilization. He would show how the development of the arts and industries of life had been guided by the distribution of minerals, how campaigns, battles, and military strategy as a whole had been dependent on the same course. The artist, the politician, the historian, the physician, the warrior were all taught that a knowledge of mineralogy would help them to success in their several pursuits. It seemed as if the most efficient training for the affairs of life were obtainable only at the mining school of Freiburg. The first feature of his grasp, distinguishable in every part of his life and work, was his overmastering sense of orderliness and method. When Werner entered upon his mineralogical studies, the science of minerals was an extraordinary chaos of detached observations and unconnected pieces of knowledge. But his very first essay began to put it into order, and by degrees he introduced into it a definite methodical treatment, doing for it very much what Linnaeus had done some years before for botany. Like that great naturalist, he had to invent a language to express with precision the characters which he wished to denote, so that mineralogists everywhere could recognize them. For this purpose he employed his mother tongue and devised a terminology which, though artificial and cumbrous, was undoubtedly of great service for a time. Uncouth in German, it became almost barbarous when translated into other languages. What would the modern English-speaking student think of a teacher who taught him, as definite characters, that a mineral could be distinguished as hard or semi-hard, soft or very soft, as very cold, cold, pretty cold, or rather cold, as fortification-wise bent, as indeterminate curved lamellar, as common angulo-granular, or as not particularly difficultly frangible? Werner arranged the external characters of minerals in so methodical a way that they could readily be applied in the practical determination of species. Yet strangely enough, he neglected the most important of them all, that of crystalline form. From the individual minerals, he proceeded to the consideration of their distribution and the character and origin of the different rocks in which they occur. To this branch of inquiry he gave the name of geognosy, or knowledge of the earth, and he defined it as the science which reveals in a methodical order the terrestrial globe as a whole, and more particularly the layers of mineral matter whereof it consists, informing as to the position and relations of these layers to each other, and enabling the formation of some idea of their origin. 
The term geology had not yet come into use, nor would either Werner or any of his followers have adopted it as a synonym for the geognosy of the Freiburg school. They prided themselves on their close adherence to fact as opposed to theory. They boasted of the minuteness and precision of their master's system, and contrasted the positive results to which it led with what they regarded as the vague conclusions and unsupported or idle speculations of other writers. Werner arranged the crust of the earth into a series of formations, which he labeled and described with the same precision that he applied to the minerals in his cabinet. But never in the history of science did a stranger hallucination arise than that of Werner and his school when they supposed themselves to discard theory and build on a foundation of accurately ascertained fact. Never was a system devised in which theory was more rampant, theory, too, unsupported by observation, and, as is now known, utterly erroneous. One of the fundamental postulates of the Wernerian doctrines was the existence of what were termed universal formations. When he elaborated his system, Werner had never been out of Saxony in the immediate adjacent regions. His practical knowledge of the earth was, therefore, confined to what he could see there, and so little was then known of the geological structure of the globe as a whole that he could not add much to his acquaintance with the subject by reading what had been observed by others, though there can be little doubt that he stood greatly indebted to Lemon and Fuchsel. With this slender stock of acquirement, he adopted the old idea that the whole globe had once been surrounded with an ocean of water, at least as deep as the mountains were high, and he believed that from this ocean there were deposited by chemical precipitation the solid rocks which now form most of the dry land. He taught that these original formations were universal, extending round the whole globe, though not without interruption, and that they followed each other in a certain order. Werner affirmed that the first formed rocks were entirely of chemical origin, and he called them primitive, including in them granite, which was the oldest, gneiss, mica slate, clay slate, serpentine, basalt, porphyry, and concluding with cyanite as the youngest. Succeeding these came what he afterwards separated as the transition rocks, consisting chiefly of chemical productions, grey wax, grey wax slate, and limestone but comprising the earliest mechanical depositions and indicating the gradual lowering of the level of the universal ocean. Still newer, and occupying, on the whole, lower positions, marking the continued retirement of the waters, were the Floetz rocks, composed partly of chemical, but chiefly of mechanical sediments, and including sandstone, limestone, gypsum, rock salt, coal, basalt, obsidian, porphyry, and other rocks. Latest of all came the alluvial series, consisting of recent loams, clays, sands, gravels, sinters, and peat. This system was not put forward tentatively as a suggestion toward better comprehension of the history of the earth. It was announced dogmatically as a body of ascertained truth about which there could be no further doubt or dispute. Quote, In recapitulating the state of our present knowledge, end quote, Werner declares with his characteristic emphasis, quote, It is obvious that we know with certainty that the Floets and Primitive Mountains have been produced by a series of precipitations and depositions formed in succession from water which covered the globe. We are also certain that the fossils which constitute the beds and strata of mountains were dissolved in this universal water and were precipitated from it. Consequently, the metals and minerals found in primitive rocks and in the beds of Floet's mountains were also contained in this universal solvent and were formed from it by precipitation. We are still further certain that at different periods different fossils have been formed from it, at one time earthy, at another metallic minerals, at a third time some other fossils. We know, too, from the position of these fossils, one above another, to determine with the utmost precision which are the oldest and which are the newest precipitates. We are also convinced that the solid mass of our globe has been produced by a series of precipitations formed in succession, in the humid way, that the pressure of the materials thus accumulated was not the same throughout the whole, and that this difference of pressure and several other concurring causes have produced rents in the substance of the earth, chiefly in the most elevated parts of its surface. We are also persuaded that the precipitates taking place from the universal water must have entered into the open fissures which the water covered. We know, moreover, for certain that veins bear all the marks of fissures formed at different times, and, 
by the causes which have been assigned for their formation, that the mass of veins is absolutely of the same nature as the beds and strata of the mountains, and that the nature of the masses differs only in the locality of the cavity where they occur. In fact, the solution contained in its great reservoir, that excavation which held the universal water, was necessarily subjected to a variety of motion, while that part of it which was confined to the fissures was undisturbed and deposited in a state of tranquility its precipitate. End quote. It would be difficult to cite from any other modern scientific treatise a series of consecutive sentences containing a larger number of dogmatic assertions of which almost every one is contradicted by the most elementary facts of observation. The habit of confident affirmation seems to have blinded Werner to the palpable absurdity of some of his statements. For example, the theory of a universal primeval ocean occupying an excavation that was so deep that it overtopped the highest mountains was superficially most ridiculous. If this ocean covered the entire globe, where was the excavation and how did this deep ocean disappear? It may be interesting to know how Werner explained this natural question, but none of his writings satisfactorily answer it. In one place he thinks it possible that, quote, one of the celestial bodies which sometimes approach near to the earth may have been able to withdraw a portion of our atmosphere and of our ocean, end quote. But if once the waters were abstracted, how were they to be brought back again so as to cover all the hills on which his highest floets formations were deposited? One might have thought that, having disposed of the universal ocean, even in this rather peremptory fashion, the Vernerians would have been in no hurry to call it back again and set the same stupendous and inexplicable machinery once more going, but the exigencies of their theory left them no choice. Having determined, as an incontrovertible fact, that certain rocks had been deposited as chemical precipitates in a definite order from universal ocean, when these philosophers, as their knowledge of nature increased, found that some of these so-called precipitates occurred out of their due sequence and at much higher altitudes than had been supposed, they were compelled to bring back the universal ocean and make it rise high over hills from which it had already receded. Not only had they to call up the vasty deep, but they had to endow it with rapid and even tumultuous movement as it swept upward over forest-clothed lands, having raised it as high as their so-called floets formations extended, and having allowed its waters to settle and deposit precipitates of basalt and greenstone, they had to hurry it away again to the unknown regions where it still remains. So early as 1768, before Werner had commenced his mineralogical studies, Rasp had truly characterized the basalts of Hesse as of igneous origin. Arduino had pointed out numerous varieties of trap rock in the Vincentine as analogous to volcanic products and as distinctly referable to ancient submarine eruptions. Desmarest had, in company with Fortis, examined the Vincentine in 1766 and confirmed Arduino's views. In 1772, Banks, Solander, and Troil compared the columnar basalt of Hecla with that of the Hebrides. Collini, in 1774, recognized the true nature of the igneous rocks on the Rhine between Andernach and Bonn. In 1775, Guettard visited the Vivirais and established the relation of basaltic currents to lavas. Lastly, in 1779, Faugus published his description of the volcanoes of the Vivirais and Vele and showed how the streams of basalt had poured out from craters which still remain in a perfect state. End of section 7. Recording by Grognor. Section 8 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Geology. Chapter 4, Part 2. Leopold von Buch, 1774 to 1852, was the most illustrious of the geologists taught by Werner. He was born in the castle of Stolp in Pomerania, the son of a nobleman with considerable property. 
While still a boy, he displayed a passionate love of scientific inquiry, and his fondness for chemical and physical mineralogical studies led him to select the Mining Academy of Freiburg for his collegiate course. While there, Alexander von Humboldt and Freiesleben were among his fellow students, and with them he formed close ties of friendship. He made his home for nearly three years, 1790 to 1793, with Professor Werner, for whom he entertained the deepest sentiments of reverence and friendship, and these were in no way altered when, in after years, some of his opinions began to diverge from the teaching of Werner. Von Buch examined the raised beaches and terraces of Scandinavia and came to the conclusion that the Swedish coast was slowly rising above the level of the sea. In this he agreed with the opinion that had been formed by Playfair with regard to the raised beaches of Scotland. In 1809 von Buch was chiefly engaged in the mineralogical and geological researches in the Alps. Meanwhile, great interest had been roused throughout Europe by the results of von Humboldt's brilliant volcanic studies in Central and South America, and von Buch determined to make a special study of some volcanic district. Accompanied by the English botanist Charles Smith, he visited the Canary Isles and in 1815 convinced himself that they had been the center of intense volcanic activity. In his famous monograph, A Physical Description of the Canary Islands, published in 1825, he enunciated his hypothesis of upheaval craters and distinguished between centers and bands of volcanic action. In 1817 he traveled to Scotland and visited Staffa and the Giant's Causeway. When he again returned to the Alps, he renounced the Vernerian doctrines of the origin of basalt and other volcanic rocks and described the upheaval of the Alps to the intrusion of igneous rocks. At the time when Werner was in the zenith of his fame, during those seventies and eighties of the eighteenth century when young geologists were flocking to hear the wisdom from the lips of the prophet of Geognosy in Freiburg, a private gentleman, living quietly in Edinburgh, was deliberating and writing a work on the Earth's surface that will live forever in the annals of geology as one of its noblest classics. His work, and that of his contemporaries, is ably reviewed by Carl von Zitto. James Hutton, 1726 to 1797, the author of the famous Theory of the Earth, was the son of a merchant and received an excellent education at the high school and university of his native city. His strong bent for chemical science induced him to select medicine as a profession. He studied at Edinburgh, Paris, and Leiden and took his degree at Leiden in 1749, but on his return to Scotland he did not follow out his profession. Having inherited an estate in Berkwickshire from his father, he went to reside there and interested himself in agriculture and in chemical and geological pursuits. From his early days he had always taken a delight in studying the surface forms and rocks of the earth's crust, and had lost no opportunity of extending his geological knowledge during frequent journeys in Scotland, England, in northern France, and the Netherlands. At last Hutton set himself to the work of shaping his ideas into a coherent, comprehensive form, and in 1785 read his paper on the Theory of the Earth before the Royal Society of Edinburgh. The publication of the work attracted little favorable notice, partly due to the involved, unattractive style of writing. In larger measure, however, it was due to the fact that the learning of the schools had no part in Hutton's work. For the best part of his life he had conned them, tossed them in his mind, tested them, and sought repeated confirmation in nature before he had even begun to fix them in written words or cared to think of anything but his own enjoyment of them. Hutton's work was projected upon a plane half a century beyond the recognized geology of his own time. Hutton's audience of geologists had to grow up under other influences than polemical discussions between Neptunists and Plutonists and had to learn from Hutton himself how to tap the fountain of science at its living source. In 1793, a Dublin mineralogist, Kirwan, attacked Hutton's work, and the great Scotsman, now advanced in years, resolutely determined to revise his work and do his best by it. Valuable additions were made and the subject matter brought under more skillful treatment. In 1795 the revised work appeared at Edinburgh in independent form and in two volumes. It was his last effort. He died two years later from an internal disease which had overshadowed the closing years of his life. The original treatise of Hutton is divided into four parts. 
The first two parts discuss the origin of rocks. The earth is described as a firm body, enveloped in a mantle of water and atmosphere, and which has been exp during immeasurable periods of time to constant change in its surface conformation. The events of past geologic ages can be more satisfactorily predicted from a careful examination of present conditions and processes. The earth's crust, as far as it is open to investigation, is largely composed of sandstones, clays, pebble deposits, and limestones that have accumulated on the bed of the ocean. The limestones represent the aggregated shells and remains of marine organisms, while the other deposits represent fragmental material transported from the continents. In addition to these sedimentary deposits of secondary origin, there are primary rocks, such as granite and porphyry, which, as a rule, underlie the aqueous deposits. In earlier periods, the earth presented the aspect of an immense ocean, surmounted here and there by islands and continents of primary rock. There must have been some powerful agency that converted the loose deposits into solid rock and elevated the consolidated sediments above the level of the sea to form new islands and continents. According to Hutton, this agency could only have been heat. It could not have been water since the cement material, quartz, felspar, fluorine, etc., of many sedimentary rocks is not readily soluble in water and could scarcely have been provided by water. On the other hand, most solid rocks are intermingled with silicious, bituminous, or other material which may be melted under the influence of heat. This suggested to Hutton his theory that at a certain depth, the sedimentary deposits are melted by the heat to which they are subjected, but that the tremendous weight of the superincumbent water causes the mineral elements to consolidate once more into coherent rock masses. He applied this theory of the melting and subsequent consolidation of rock material universally to all pelagic and terrestrial sediments. In the third part, it is shown that the present land areas of the globe are composed of rock strata which have consolidated during past ages in the bed of the ocean. These are said to have been pushed upward by the expansive force of heat, while the strata have been bent and tilted during the upheaval. Hutton next describes the occurrence of crust fissures both during the consolidation of the rock and during the elevation of large areas and the subsequent inrush of molten rock or mineral ores into the fissures. He regards volcanoes as safety valves during upheaval, which by affording exit at the surface for the molten rock magma and superheated vapors prevent the expansive forces from raising the continents too far. The evidences of volcanic eruption in the older geological epochs are next discussed. Hutton expresses the opinion that during the earlier eruptions the molten rock material spread out between the accumulated sediments or filled crust fissures, but did not actually escape at the surface. Consequently, that the older rock magmas had solidified at great depths in the crust and under enormous pressure of superincumbent rocks. He calls the older eruptive rocks subterraneous lavas, and includes among them porphyry and the windstones. E.Q. trap rock, greenstone, basalt, whack, amygdaloidal rocks. Granite was also added in a later treatise. Hutton points out that the subterraneous lavas have a crystalline structure, whereas those that solidify at the surface have a slaggy or vesicular structure. In the fourth part, Hutton concentrates attention on the pre-existence of older continents and islands from which the materials composing more recent land areas must have been derived. He likewise discusses the evidence of pre-existing pelagic, littoral, and terrestrial faunas from which existing faunas must have sprung. But, he continues, the existence of ancient faunas assumes an abundant vegetation, and direct evidence of extinct floras is presented in the coal and bituminous deposits of the Carboniferous and other epochs. Other evidence is afforded in the silicified trunks of trees that occasionally are found in marine deposits and have clearly been swept into the sea from adjacent lands. Hutton then sets forth, in passages that have become classic in geological science, the slow process of the subaerial denudation of land surfaces, he describes the effects of atmospheric weathering, of chemical decomposition of the rocks, of their demolition by various causes, and the constant attrition of the soil by the chemical and mechanical action of water. He elucidates with convincing clearness the destructive, physical, chemical, and mechanical agencies that affect the dissolution of rocks. 
the work of running water in transporting the worn material from the land to the ocean, the steady subsidence of coarser and finer detritus that goes on in seas and oceans, lakes and rivers, and the slow accumulation of the deposits to form rock strata. Hutton impresses upon his readers the vastness of the geological eons necessary for the completion of any such cycle of destruction and construction. In proof of this, he calls attention to the comparative insignificance of any changes that have taken place in the surface conformation of the globe within historic time. Hutton was thus the great founder of physical and dynamical geology. He, for the first time, established the essential correlation in the processes of denudation and deposition— he showed how, in proportion as an old continent is worn away, the materials for a new continent are being provided, how the deposits rise anew from the bed of the ocean, and another land replaces the old in the eternal economy of nature. The outcome of Hutton's argument is expressed in his words, quote, that we find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end, end quote. When Hutton's theory of the Earth's structure is compared with that of Werner and other contemporary or older writers, the great feature which distinguishes it and marks its superiority is the strict inductive method applied throughout. Every conclusion is based upon observed data that are carefully enumerated, no supernatural or unknown forces are resorted to, and the events and changes of past epochs are explained from analogy with the phenomena of the present age. Hutton's explanation of the uprising of continents, owing to the expansive force of the subterranean heat, was not altogether new, nor was it satisfactory. Neither had Hutton any clear conception of the significance of fossils as affording evidence of a gradual evolution. Yet in spite of these disadvantages, Hutton's theory of the earth is one of the masterpieces in the history of geology. Hutton's genius first gave to geology the conception of calm, inexorable nature working little by little, by the raindrop, by the stream, by insidious decay, by slow waste, by the life and death of all organized creatures, and eventually accomplishing surface transformations on a scale more gigantic than was ever imagined in the philosophy of the ancients or the learning of the schools. Hutton's scientific spirit and genial personality won for him many friends and adherents among the members of the Edinburgh Academy. The most distinguished of these were Sir James Hall and the mathematician John Playfair. Hall, 1762-1831, contested the validity of the opinion held by some of Hutton's opponents, that the melting of crystalline rocks would only yield amorphous glassy masses. Hall followed experimental methods. He selected different varieties of ancient basalt and lavas from Vesuvius and Etna, reduced them to a molten state, and allowed them to cool. At first he arrived only at negative results, as vitreous masses were produced, but then he retarded the process of cooling and actually succeeded in obtaining solid, crystalline rock material. By regulating the temperature and the time allowed for the cooling and consolidation, Hall could produce rocks varying from finely to coarsely crystalline structure and he therefore proved that under certain conditions, crystalline rock could, as Hutton had said, be produced by the cooling of molten rock magma. Hall then put to the test Hutton's further hypothesis, that limestone was melted and recrystallized in nature. To this hypothesis the objection had been made that the carbonic acid gas must escape if limestone were brought to a glowing heat and the material would be converted into quicklime. This was Hall's first experience. Then he devised another experiment— he introduced chalk or powdered limestone into porcelain tubes or barrels, sealed them, and brought them to a very high temperature. The carbon dioxide gas could not escape under these conditions. The calcareous material was thus subjected to the enormous pressure of the imprisoned air and converted into a granular substance resembling marble. Hall also conducted experiments on the bending and folding of rocks. He spread out alternate horizontal layers of cloth and clay, placed a weight upon them and subjected them to strong lateral pressure. These and similar experiments have often been repeated within recent years, and it is well known that in this way phenomena of deformation can be artificially produced which bear the closest resemblance to the phenomena of rock deformation under natural conditions. In his desire to vindicate Hutton's theory, Hall became himself one of the great founders of experimental geology. At the same time, John Playfair... 1748 to 1819, whose interest in geology had been roused by Hutton's companionship, became the enthusiastic exponent of Hutton's theory. 
It was Playfair's literary skill that opened the eyes of scientific men to the heritage Hutton had left for them. He did for Hutton's teaching what fifty years after was done for Darwin's doctrines by the gifted Huxley. Playfair's illustration of the Huttonian theory is a lucid exposition of that theory in the form of twenty-six ample discussive notes. Playfair's work differs in no essential point from the views held by his master and friend, but many subjects which receive a subordinate treatment in the theory of the earth are brought into prominence by Playfair and placed for the first time on a firm scientific basis. His treatment of valley and lake erosion is extremely able, and Playfair was the first geologist who realized that the huge erratic blocks might have been carried to their present position by former glaciers. His insight in this respect would have alone won him for a lasting fame, for the erratics on alpine slopes and plains had long been observed by geologists and an explanation vainly sought. End of section 8 Recording by Grognor Section 9 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2, Geology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zames Curran. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 2. Edited by Francis Rotewheeler. Geology. Chapter 5. Development of Modern Knowledge. Part 1. With Hutton's work as a basic point, geology took new life. The theory in the main was sound. It remained but to classify the results of the past and to prepare for the reception of the observations of the future. The 19th century witnessed the great development of the process of the Earth's formation from stratigraphical geology set forth. Jean-Baptiste Pierre Antoine de Monet, Chevalier de Lamarck, 1744-1829, came from an ancient but somewhat decayed family and was born in a village of Picari as the eleventh and youngest child of the Seigneur de Barn. The earlier part of his career was devoted first to soldiering, then to botany, and then to zoology. Though Lamarck wrote little on geology, the extent to which he had pondered over the problems of the science, which in his time had hardly taken definite shape, is well illustrated by the little volume which he published in 1802 under the title of Hydrogeology. He recognized that nothing can ultimately resist the alternating influence of wetness and drought, combined with that of heat and cold, and that the disintegration of mineral substances by these atmospheric conditions prepares the way for the erosive action of running water in all its various forms. To him, it was clear that every mountain which had not been erupted by volcanic action or by some other catastrophe had been cut out of a plain, so that the mountain summits represent the relics of that plain, save insofar as its level has been lowered in the general degradation. He admits that in many mountains the component strata were often vertical or highly inclined. But he will not in that account believe in any universal catastrophe, such as has been demanded by many previous writers and was still loudly advocated in his own time by his fellow countryman, Curvier. Lamarck conceived the ocean basin to owe its existence and preservation to the perpetual oscillation of the tides and partly also to the general westerly movement of the water. He supposed the tidal oscillation to be a gigantic force, which has actually eroded the basin and now prevents it from being shallowed, through the deposit of land-derived sediment. By continually scoring this sediment out and casting it along the more sheltered shores of the land, no one before his time had been able to follow so clearly the successive stages through which organic remains pass until they become crystalline stone presenting no trace of their original organic structure. During the last ten years of his long life, he suffered from total blindness and had to rely on the affectionate devotion of his eldest daughter for the completion of such works as he had in progress before his eyesight failed. 
the world is becoming more conscious now of what it owes to the genius of this illustrious naturalist. Among those students of science who have the most reason to cherish his memory, geologists should look back gratefully to his services in starting the science of paleontology, in propounding that the doctrine of evolution, and in affirming that the great insight of some of the fundamental principles of modern geology. Georges Curva, 1769-1832, a French naturalist and founder of the science of comparative anatomy, effected a great and noble advance in the science of paleontology. It is to Curva that the world owes its first systematic application of that science of comparative anatomy, which he himself did so much to place upon a sound basis to the study of the bones of fossil animals. He demonstrated that extinct animals could be reconstructed from fragmentary remains by applying the law of correction of growth. It is true, as pointed out by Professor Huxley, that he placed more confidence and security in this law than its empiric nature and exceptions would justify. Favre, in his work in the geology of the Paris Basin, was greatly assisted by his friend Alexander Bronnier. Bronnier was early trained in scientific pursuits. In 1807, he published a treatise on mineralogy, which became a standard work. He became professor of mineralogy at the Jardin des Plaines, and in 1808 appeared the work on the Paris Basin. Couvert and Bronnier drew up a systematic table of the succession of the stratigraphical horizons in accordance primarily with the sequence of the deposits in the ground and with the particular fossils characterizing each group of deposits. The varieties of rock and the thicknesses and distribution of the different deposits were also fully considered and carefully mapped. Omalis de Holloy, 1783-1875, the Belgian geologist, made an examination of the formations of the Auvergne, Velay, and in parts of Italy and Germany, and in all cases proved conclusively that the fossil remains had been embedded in the deposits of freshwater marshes and were not remains which had been accidentally swept into marine deposits. The Belgian geologist supplemented the observations of Cuvier and Barnier with great success. Early in his career, de Haller had regarded the position of the strata their horizontal, slightly or highly inclined, or vertical position of great importance in determining the age of the strata. He thought the horizontal strata corresponded to Werner's floats formations and all inclined strata to Werner's transitional formations. But his subsequent visit to the Alps and Ural Mountains caused him to modify these views. The fearful earthquake which destroyed Lisbon in 1755, was made the subject of a large number of scientific inquiries into the causes of earthquakes. William Stuckley's theory, attributing earthquakes to electrical disturbances, gained a certain amount of support abroad. Another Englishman, Reverend John Marshall, suggested that sudden expansion of vapors enclosed in fissures and cavities in the Earth's crust caused earthquakes and volcanoes, the upheaval of mountain systems, and the deformation of rocks. In 1760, he published a series of observations on earthquakes in mountain structure. This paper was accompanied by an ideal section through a mountain system, showing a central core composed of the crystalline mass of rocks on either side in succession of uptilted and upheaved strata covered in their turn by younger, slightly tilted or horizontal deposits composing the neighboring plains. Marshall however, did not draw any general conclusions, yet he deservedly ranks as the great pioneer of the modern science of seismology. Another English observer was John Whitehurst, 1713-1788, who published in 1778 an inquiry into the original state and formation of the earth. This work was the last effort of the fantastic English school of cosmologists. Amid absurd speculations as to the condition of chaos and other equally visionary topics, he wrote well on organic remains and showed that he clearly grasped the stratigraphical succession 
of the formation in Derbyshire and other parts of England. Quote, the strata invariably follows each other, end quote, he remarks. Quote, as it were, in alphabetical order, end quote. And though they may not be alike in all parts of the earth, nevertheless, in each particular part, how much soever they may differ, yet they follow each other in a regular succession. He was one of the many who were interested in the origin of the basalic pillars of the Giant's Causeway, and who endeavored to interpret their origins. One of the most active and interesting of those who devoted themselves with ardor to the study of the Italian volcanoes was Garata di Dolomiul, 1750 to 1801. His attention was especially drawn to the active and extinct volcanoes of the Mediterranean basin. As far back as 1776, he made an announcement that he had found in Portugal evidence of volcanoes older than certain mountains of limestone a statement which he supplemented in 1784 with further evidence from Sicily proving the intercalation of ancient lavas among stratified deposits. Dolomul confirmed the igneous origin of Balsoc rock, regarding it as a variety of lava, for the most part associated with submarine eruptions. His name is perpetuated in the name of the Dolomites, given to the beautiful district in South Tyrol, south of the Punster Valley. Elie de Beaumont was another scientific Frenchman who interested himself in mountains. He was one of the most enthusiastic adherents of the Vulcanist doctrines. Toward the end of an article on mountains, which appeared in the annals of the French Academy, are a few remarks on mountain structure. Brief although they are, the remarks on the influence of the slow cooling of the earth on surface conformation, and the origin of furrows and fissures are at once recognized by a reader of the present day as the starting point of the modern view on mountain structure. Later appeared his three-volume treatise on mountain systems. He points out that in virtue of the continued cooling of the planet, the radius is shortened and the crust is affected by a general centripetal movement, that is, the volume of the globe becoming less. The crust is drawn in toward the center of gravity. Delise, meanwhile, had calculated 1,340 meters as the amount by which the Earth's radius had already been shortened. In other words, the Earth's crust in the course of the geological epochs had approached the Earth's center by a distance about equal to the height of Chiboraza or the Himalayas above sea level. William Smith, 1769 to 1839, an English engineer, was the first to recognize the importance of fossils in their full significance as a means of determining the relative age of strata. Born in a country that was unusually rich in fossil remains, he had in his boyhood abundant opportunity of observing and collecting. For 25 years, he continued his investigation of all parts of England, entering his observations in colored geographical maps and compiled them from time to time in the form of tables or as explanatory notes to his maps. About 1800, he began the preparation of a geographical map of England and Wales on the scale of five miles to one inch, which occupied nearly 15 years of his life, and which was supplemented by separate maps of the counties, published in color on 21 sheets. Smith's map is the first attempt to represent on a large scale the geographical relations of any extensive tract of ground in Europe. It was a magnificent achievement and was the model of all subsequent geological maps. For English geography, the publication of the map was the starting point of a new regime. The Geological Society of London conferred upon him the Wollaston Medal, and he well deserves to be called the father of English geology. There is yet another name that deserves to be remembered in any review of the early efforts to group the secondary formations, that of Thomas Webster, 1773 to 1844. As far back as 1811, this clever artist and keen-eyed geologist began a series of investigations of the coast sections of the Isle of Wight and of Dorset 
and continue them for three years. He clearly defined each of the leading subdivisions of the Creotius series and prepared the way for the admirable later and more detailed work of William Henry Fitton, 1780 to 1861, to whom geology is indebted for the first detailed and accurate determination of the succession of strata and their distinctive fossils. From the base of the chalk down into the Olites in the south of England and the neighboring region in France. More particularly, he showed the relations and importance of the green sand formations, his memoirs on which are now among the classics of English geology. The early progress of stratigraphical geology in Britain includes the important influence exerted by the Geological Society of London, which was founded in 1807 to investigate the mineral structure of the earth. At the time, the warfare between the Neptunists and the Plutonists still continued, but there were many men interested in the study of geological subjects who were weary of the conflict of hypothesis and who would fain devote their time and energy to the accumulation of facts regarding the ancient history of the globe rather than to the elaboration of theories to explain them. A few such inquirers formed themselves into the Geological Society, and soon attracted others around them until, in a few years, they had established an active institution which became a center for geological research and discussion, published the contributions of its members in quattro volumes, and eventually was incorporated by royal charter as one of the leading scientific bodies of the country. This society, which has been the parent of others in different countries, continues to flourish, and its publications, extending over nearly a century, contain a record of the original researches which have powerfully helped the progress of all branches of geology. Besides their papers issued by the Society, some of the early members published separate works which greatly advanced the cause of their favorite science. Among these early independent treatises, perhaps the most important was the Outlines of the Geology of England and Wales by W. D. Conybeare, 1787 to 1857, and W. Phillips, 1775 to 1828, which appeared in 1822. In this volume, all that was then known regarding the rocks of the country, from the youngest formations down to the old red sandstone, was summarized in clear and methodical a manner as to give a definite impulse to the cultivation of geology in England. The amount of ascertained fact regarding the structure and history of the earth was every year increasing at so rapid a rate that it became necessary to prepare digests of it for the use of those who wished to be informed on these subjects or to keep pace with the advance of knowledge. Hence arose in different countries textbooks, manuals, and other general treatises. Herein an account was given of the facts and principles of geological science. But of all the English writers of general treatises on geology, the first place must undoubtedly be assigned to Charles Lyell, 1797-1875, who exercised a profound influence on the geology of his time in all English-speaking countries, adopting the principles of the Hutton theory, says Sir Archibald Gecke, in his Founders of Geology, he developed them until the original enunciator of them was nearly lost sight of. Quote, With unwearied industry, he marshaled in admirable order all the observations that he could collect in support of the doctrine, that the present is the key to the past. With inimitable lucidity, he traced the operation of existing causes and held them up as a measure of those which had acted in bygone time. He carried Hutton's doctrine to its logical conclusion, for not only did he refuse to allow the introduction of any process which could not be shown to be part of the present system of nature, he would not even admit that there were any reasons to support the degree of activity of geological agents to have ever seriously differed from what it has been within human experience. He became the great high priest of uniformitarianism, the creed which grew to be almost universal in England during his life, but which never made much way in the rest of Europe, and which 
to its extreme form is probably now held by few geologists in the country. End quote. Lyell's Principles of Geology will, however, always rank as one of the classics of geology and must form an early part of the reading of every man who would wish to make himself an accomplished geologist. The last part of his work was ultimately published as a separate volume with the title Elements of Geology, in which a large space was devoted to an account of the stratified fossiliferous formations. This treatise, diligently kept up to date by its author, continued during his lifetime to be the chief English exposition of its subject and the handbook of every English geologist. End of section 9section 10 of the science history of the universe volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the science history of the universe volume 2 edited by francis rolt wheeler geology chapter 5 development of modern knowledge Part 2 Lyell's function was mainly that of a critic and exponent of the researches of his contemporaries, and of a philosophical writer thereon, with a rare faculty of perceiving the connection of scattered facts with each other, and with the general principles of science. As Ramsey once remarked, We collect the data, and Lyell teaches us to comprehend the meaning of them. But Lyell, though he did not, like Sedgwick and Murchison, add new chapters to geological history, nevertheless left his mark upon the nomenclature and classification of the geological record. Conceiving, as far back as 1828, the idea of arranging the whole series of tertiary formations in four groups, according to their affinity to the living fauna, he established, in conjunction with the Shays, who had independently formed a similar opinion, the well-known classification into Eocene, Miocene, and Pliocene, the scheme was a somewhat artificial one, and the original percentages have had to be modified from time to time, but the terms have kept their place, and are now firmly planted in the geological language of all corners of the globe. So far, no complete subdivision of the immense complex of strata between the crystalline schists and the coal measures had been attempted, and it was this gigantic task that the two British geologists, Adam Sedgwick, 1785-1873, and Roderick Murchison, 1792-1871, set themselves to accomplish in the British area. Unfortunately, the scarcity of fossils made it still impossible for Sedgwick to establish paleontological subdivisions. Murchison was more fortunate. While his colleague was engaged in the examination of the oldest group of the transitional series, Murchison began his investigation of the series in descending order from the upper members to the lower. He examined the exposures of old red sandstone and the rocks immediately below it, which occur on the eastern and southern borders of Wales. Murchison found fossils in abundance, and in a couple of years was able to lay before the Geological Society a complete paleontological sequence in the upper portion of the transitional formations. At first, Murchison had called these higher members examined by him an upper fossiliferous greywax series. But in the year 1835, in compliance with the strongly expressed wish of Eli de Beaumont, he proposed the name Silurian System as a special designation for the upper members. And as the older members of the transitional series examined by Sedgwick and Cumberland in North Wales could not be identified with any of the members of the Silurian System of Murchison, the term of Cambrian Series was proposed by Sedgwick in 1836 for these older members, and this term was accepted by Murchison. In the year 1839, Murchison published his great work, The Silurian System, wherein the results of his researches, extending over six years, were admirably elucidated. After a short statement regarding the younger geological formations, and a more detailed account of the English Carboniferous Formation, the Mountain Limestone, and the Old Red Sandstone, Murchison passes to the special description of the Silurian System in South Wales and the adjoining counties of England. With great accuracy, he depicts the stratigraphical relations, the lithological characters of the rocks, the contents of fossils and minerals, and the occurrences of volcanic rocks. 
A special paleontological part with 27 quattro plates is devoted to the description of the characteristic fossils by Elagassi, Sowerby, and Lonsdale. Numerous colored sections help to demonstrate the tectonic relations of the district. Murchison distinguished three chief divisions in the Silurian system. Upper Silurian, comprising the Ludlow Rocks and Wenlock Limestone. Lower Silurian, comprising the Cotter Rock Sandstone and Landelio Flags and Cambrian. He found it impossible at the time to fix a definite paleontological horizon as the lower limit of the Silurian system, and Sedgwick also could not assign any paleontological or other feature which would determine the upper limit of the Cambrian series. Nevertheless, the recognition of the Silurian and Cambrian systems was one of the most important advances that had been made in stratigraphy. There still remained, however, a thick group of strata in the Wernian transitional series, which could not be allotted to either of the newly defined systems. Continued researches on the Paleozoic formations led Murchison to conclude that the Cambrian deposits examined by Sedgwick in North Wales contained no fossils different from those of the Lower Silurian, and that the Cambrian system was identical with the Lower Silurian. Murchison made known this opinion for the first time in a presidential address which he delivered at the Geological Society. Sedgwick was deeply hurt, and immediately began a new investigation of Wales, in which he was assisted by the paleontologist Salter, and in 1852 he upheld the independence of the Cambrian series. Murchison was not persuaded by Sedgwick's results, and demanded a paleontological formation for the Cambrian system. The members of the geological survey, to whom the investigation of Wales was entrusted, followed the views of Murchison. The Cambrian system disappeared from the official maps and the color for Silurian rocks was carried over the whole of the area previously allotted to the Cambrian system. Sedgwick, embittered by the want of recognition for his Cambrian system, published, 1851 to 1855, a large work on the divisions and the fossils of the British Paleozoic deposits and protested, in strong terms, against the views held by his former friend and fellow worker Murchison. While this dispute was in progress in Britain, a remarkable series of investigations by Johann Brande, 1799-1883, had made known the extraordinary abundance and variety of Silurian fossils in Bohemia. The distinguished observer not only recognized the equivalence of Murchison's upper and lower Silurian series, but found below that series a still older group of strata, characterized by a different assemblage of fossils, which he termed the first or primordial fauna. It was ascertained that representatives of this fauna occur in Wales among some of the divisions of Sedgwick's Cambrian system, far below the Landilio group which formed the original base of the Silurian series. Eventually, therefore, since the death of the two great disputants, there has been a general consensus of opinion that the top of the Cambrian system should be drawn at the upper limit of the primordial fauna. The vast and varied series of rocks which have now been ascertained to underlie the oldest Cambrian strata have undergone much scrutiny during the last half-century, and their true nature and sequence are beginning to be understood. The first memorable onward step in this investigation was taken in North America by William Edmund Logan, 1798-1875. He recognized the existence of at least three vast systems older than the oldest fossiliferous formations. He may be said to have inaugurated the detailed study of pre-Cambrian rocks. Subsequent investigation has shown the structure of the regions which he explored to be even more complicated and difficult than he believed it to be, and various important modifications have been proposed in his work and terminology by the able geologists of Canada and the United States who have continued his labors. But he will ever stand forward as one of the pioneers of geology, who, in the face of incredible difficulties, first opened the way towards a comprehension of the oldest rocks of the crust of the earth. Charles Darwin, 1809 to 1882, contributed several valuable works to the literature of geology. The two geological chapters in his Origin of Species produced a great revolution in geological thought. To most of the geologists of his day, Darwin's contention for the imperfection of the geological record and his demonstration of it came as a kind of surprise and awakening. They had never realized that the history revealed by the long succession of fossiliferous formations which they had imagined to be so full, was in reality so fragmentary. And yet, when Darwin pointed out this fact to them, they were compelled, sometimes rather reluctantly, to admit that he was right. 
Lord Kelvin, Sir William Thompson, 1824 to 1907, attributed great importance to the enormous pressure existing in the interior of the Earth and the consolidation of the nucleus from this cause. He ascribed to the body of the Earth a degree of rigidity intermediate between that of steel and of glass. Starting from the nebular theory, Lord Kelvin supposed that the cooled and thereby heavier masses sank inward and formed an initial central nucleus, which always extended toward the periphery as the Earth's mass continued to cool, until finally almost the whole Earth became rigid. Sir Andrew Crombie Ramsay, 1814-1891, the noted Scotch geologist, devoted his attention to the physical side of geology. His dislike for paleontology and petrology sometimes led him into serious theoretical errors, thereby impairing the value of his work. His book on The Glacial Origin of Certain Lakes in Switzerland set forth the theory that certain lake basins had been scooped out by glaciers, now melted away. This book aroused considerable interest and controversy. This hypothesis has not yet been disproved, but it has failed to gather its most ardent supporters from the ranks of those who have an intimate personal knowledge of the Alps. In Austria and Switzerland, Zeus, Hochstetter, Neumer, Studer, Agassi, and others were making themselves famous. Zeus's contributions to geology have opened up a new path in geological inquiry and led the formation for what is now frequently termed the New Geology, dealing with the construction and relations of continents and mountain ranges, the dynamics of volcanoes and earthquakes, and the general movement of the Earth's crust. In 1885, he began his Antilites de Erde, which is a masterful exposition of the relations of the dominant features of the Earth's surface, and the first luminous effort to correlate their multiform aspects and to give to them their true geological expression. He is one of the recognized authorities on earthquakes and volcanoes. Jean-Louis Rudolf Agassi, 1807 to 1873, was born in Switzerland and rose to distinction by his scientific work in Europe. But he went to the United States when he was still only 42 years of age and spent the last 27 years of his life as an energetic and successful leader of science in his adopted home. His fame is thus both European and American, and the geologists of New England, not less than those of Switzerland, may claim him as one of their most distinguished worthies. His fame as a geologist is due to the important part he took in founding the modern school of glacial geology. Tracing the distribution of the erratic blocks above the present level of the glaciers, and far beyond their existing limits, he connected these transported masses with the polished and striated rock surfaces which were known to extend even to the summits of the southern slopes of the Jura. He was led to conclude that the alpine ice, now restricted to the higher valleys, once extended into the central plain, crossed it, and even mounted to the southern summits of the Jura chain. Before Agassi took up the question, there were two prevalent opinions regarding the transport of the erratics. One of these called in the action of powerful floods of water. The other invoked the assistance of flowing ice. Agassi combated these views with great skill. His reasoning ought to have convinced his contemporaries that his explanation was a true one. But the conclusions at which he arrived seemed to most men of the day extravagant and incredible. Even a cautious thinker like Lyell saw less difficulty in sinking the whole of central Europe under the sea and covering the waters with floating icebergs than in conceiving that the Swiss glaciers were once large enough to reach to the Jura. Men shut their eyes to the meaning of the unquestionable fact that, while there was absolutely no evidence for a marine submergence, the former track of the glaciers could be followed mile after mile by the rocks they had scored and the blocks they had dropped, all the way from their present ends to the far distant crests of the Jura. He, moreover, demonstrated the identity of the phenomena in Britain with those in Switzerland, and claimed that not only glaciers once existed in the British islands, but that large sheets of ice covered all the surface. These, and the subsequent researches and glacial monographs of the great Swiss naturalist, started the study of ancient glaciation. At first, his conclusions had been regarded as rank heresy by the older and more conservative geologists of the day. Von Buch could hardly contain his indignation, mingled with contempt, for what seemed to him the view of a youthful and inexperienced observer. A. von Humboldt also threw cold water upon the ardor of his young friend. But by degrees the opposition waned, and Agassi had the satisfaction of seeing his most doughty opponents come over one by one to his side. William Nicoll was a lecturer on natural philosophy at Edinburgh in the early part of the last century. 
Among his inventions was the famous prism of Iceland Spar that bears his name. Every petrographer will acknowledge how indispensable this little piece of apparatus is in his microscopic investigations. He may not be aware, however, that it was the same skillful hands that devised the process of making thin slices of minerals and rocks, whereby the microscopic examination of these substances becomes possible. Yet for a quarter of a century, geologists took no notice of the opportunities put in their way by William Nicol. When Nicol died, his instruments and preparations passed into the hands of the late Mr. Alexander Bryson of Edinburgh, who, having considerable dexterity as a manipulator, and being much interested in the process, made many additions to the collections which he had acquired. At last, Henry Clifton Sorby came to Edinburgh, and had an opportunity of looking over the Bryson collection. He soon began to put the method of preparing thin slices into practice, made sections of mica schist, and found so much that was new and important, with a promise of such a further rich harvest of results, that he threw his whole energy into the investigation for several years, and produced at last, in 1858, the well-known memoir On the Microscopical Structure of Crystals, which marks one of the most prominent epochs of modern geology. Sorby, for the first time, showed how, by means of the microscope, it was possible to discover the minute structure and composition of rocks, and to learn much regarding their mode of origin. In recent years, some excellent work has been, and is constantly being done, along the line of geological investigation. Geological surveys are being conducted under the supervision of the governments of the United States, the individual states, and the countries of Europe, and prominent present-day geologists are writing invaluable books on geological subjects. Important contributions to the history of geology have been made by the fluent pens of Sir Archibald Geeky, and Carl von Zittel, to whose works much of the value of the foregoing may be ascribed, and each department of geology now is in the hands of able specialists. Geology and paleontology give great promise for the twentieth century. In another hundred years the whole surface of the earth will perhaps be so well known that works on comparative topographical geology will be fully accomplished along the lines which Edward Seuss has so ably initiated in his Antlitz der Erde. If, at the same time, the structural and physical problems of the solid earth crust continue to be accurately investigated in all parts of the earth, it may be possible to determine the actual physical sequence of events in the origin and development of this planet. End of Section 10 Recording by Todd Section 11 of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Owen Patrick. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 2. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Geology. Chapter 6. Composition of the Earth, Part 1 A discussion of the geological changes which this planet has undergone ought to be preceded by a study of the materials which enter into its composition. This branch of geology is technically termed geognosy. The Earth may be considered as a globe, which has cooled sufficiently to have a solid crust, enclosed in two envelopes or shells, the inner one of water covering about three-fourths of the globe, and the outer one of gas completely enveloping the whole. This outer envelope of gas is known as the atmosphere. The water is called the hydrosphere, and the solid globe is the lithosphere, or rock sphere. There is every reason to believe that the present gaseous and liquid envelopes of the planet are only a portion of the original mass of gas and water with which the globe was invested. As Sir Archibald Geike says in his textbook of geology, fully a half of the outer shell or crust of the earth consists of oxygen, which probably once existed in the primeval atmosphere. The extent, likewise, to which water has been abstracted by materials is almost incredible. It has been estimated that already one-third of the whole mass of the ocean has been thus absorbed. Eventually, the condition of the planet will probably resemble that of the moon, a globe without air or water or life of any kind. 